late alarm clock ticked quietly in the morning darkness. I could have bought an electronic silent one, but the analog one didn't bother me. On the contrary, the dull ticking didn't irritate her, helped her sleep, and in the morning it made her listen, dispelled her sleep. Jessica opened her eyes, glanced at the alarm clock. As always, she'd woken up 10 minutes before it rang. Now she would lie there for those 10 minutes, occasionally looking to see how much time was left. No need to get up, she'd wake up anyway. But no, there was no signal. Apparently, the brain only turns on, on cue. A reflex developed over the years. One day, Jessica set her alarm clock 10 minutes ahead. For two days, she woke up on the alarm clock and then again lay down, watching the red second hand jumping and waited for the call. Some kind of time machine, not an alarm clock. Jessica was the kind of woman that age adds beauty and confidence to. In her 20s, she was just a cute, pretty, a little simple-minded student who was being chased by all her classmates. And now, by the age of 40, she was a beautiful, stylish, pedigreed, intelligent beauty. Her self-confidence attracted men, but no one dared to come close. Too good. She was not a haughty bitch, just behind her as if she was dragging a trail of prosperous family life. In fact, it had been that way until recently. Jessica lay there waiting for the alarm clock to ring. Even anxious thoughts slipped in, but they were not formulated. There was no signal yet. The alarm clock erupted, nasty and inescapable. Jessica turned it off without pity, but the start was given with doubt and suspicion. Jessica suspected her husband doubted her happy married life. She married almost 15 years ago to a promising, aspiring businessman. At that time, Michael had a car service, and now there is a whole network. She had already graduated from college and taught at the Olympic Reserve School for several years. Promising athletes were brought here from all over the state who had already made a name for themselves at regional and national competitions. Among her students were candidates for Master of Sports, winners of championships and championships. But athletic victories are one thing, but education is another. Jessica taught English, which athletes with their terrible training regimen did not need. So Jessica's main task was to somehow, by lessons, tutoring, but to pull the hope of American sports at least for a three. One Friday night after work, Jessica and of her friend in misfortune, Emily, a math major, decided to relax at a night. Why? Young, unmarried, tired of titled, but completely uninterested students. They have a right. Stay quickly regretted coming. Too loud, too bright. Tired of dancing and shouting and trying to say something, she shoved herself into a far corner, but there was a rumble of noise and the ubiquitous twirling spotlights were in her eyes. Emily jumped up in front of the table. Don't sit there. We finally got out. She couldn't wait to rush back into the thick of the dance floor. Let's go. Let's go. I've met so many guys. Cool. Come on. I can't decide who to go with. Emily, can you do this without me? I think I'll go home. I'm tired. What are you talking about? What about home? We'll go somewhere else. Don't go now. Emily, dancing, walked back into the teeming crowd. Jessica wasn't going to wait for her. Clearly, Emily wasn't raring to go home, and there was no stopping her now. In her short dress and high heels, she was just starting to cut loose. Tonight, she was the queen of this club, and no force could make her stop now. Let her have her fun. It wasn't often they got such a break from it. Jessica waited for the music to quiet down so she could make her way to the exit through the dancing crowd. Hi, a tall young man stood in front of the table. Can I sit down? Emily has set the pace so fast and I can't take much more. Yeah, sit down. I'm just leaving anyway. Can I come with you? I want some quiet and fresh air. Let's take a little walk. Can I walk with you? That's how Jessica met Michael, her future husband. Nice guy, good manners, nice family, beautiful and properly groomed. Was there love? Of course there was. But somehow, it wasn't intense. At 17, you can run to the ends of the earth for your beloved in a frenzy of passion. At 25, you need to build a reliable, happy family based on love. And all my girlfriends are already married with children. They said, choose Jessica. Men like you won't be pecking at you anytime soon. They'll find younger ones. Take it as it comes. It was a marriage of convenience, but it wasn't about money and wealth. It was about living happily ever after. Now in 40 years, more and more often flashed the thought that the calculation was wrong. Maybe it was necessary to wait for a mad and unearthly love and even for a short time.
but to see the sky and diamonds, and not to live fifteen years of calm, prosperous, and happy life, which now flew to all hells. They didn't have children. It didn't work out. Jessica sometimes thought that if they'd had kids, things would have turned out differently. They didn't really want kids. At least Jessica didn't feel bad about it. It would have been nice to have a baby, but no, it wasn't. She never understood the enthusiasm of her friends who grabbed other people's children in their arms and hooted with them. I never felt any emotion at the sight of babies. She must be some kind of a defective. She doesn't like other people's children. If she loved her own, she wouldn't know. They don't exist. Two months ago, Jessica felt that in their family, as in the Danish kingdom, something was wrong. Everything seemed to be the same as always, but there was some kind of reticence. Like Michael had a secret. What secret? They never hid anything from each other. He looked at Jessica with a frozen stare like he couldn't see. Sometimes he seemed to want to say something, but it was as if he hadn't decided if he should. He always worked hard, and if he was late, it never occurred to Jessica to get jealous and throw tantrums. Now she was watching the clock, calculating what time he should be home. If he wasn't home on time, she'd start to worry to suspect. Of what? Well, what could one suspect a husband of? Cheating, I guess. Although it seemed to Jessica that a cheating husband should behave differently. She didn't know how. But for some reason, she didn't believe in cheating. It was too trivial. There was no other reason for the changed relationship. Michael, what time are you coming over? I don't know, it's a lot of work. You're hardly ever home, you don't tell me anything. It's like I'm not in your life. Jess, are you jealous of me? It's a little late for that, I understand about 15 years ago. But why now? I thought you know what to do when you're imagining things. Okay, I'm off, Smoochie. He poked Jessica on the cheek, grabbed his keys and left. That's how we talked. Maybe it was nothing. I made it up, I'm suffering. But a nagging sense of impending misery lingered. No, something's wrong. Something's about to happen. Jessica decided to do something useful, but not her favorite. She had her own system for keeping the house in order. Sure, dusting and scrubbing the floors was a necessity, but she hated general cleaning, never trying to do everything at once. She assigned herself half an hour of family chores. There are community chores, and these are family chores. For example, wash the window, dust the bookcase, put the kitchen shelves in order. It's not a waste of half an hour. And the things I didn't want to do are done. Today was the clothes closet's turn. It was high time to put away the winter stuff, make an inspection of t-shirts and shirts. There's probably something that needs to be thrown out by now. Well, not thrown out, but taken to the country house. They don't throw anything away. First, they take it to the country house. And then, when it's been there for two years, it goes straight to the trash. If you have a summer house, there are no trash cans at home. Going through her shirts, Jessica fumbled with something hard in her breast pocket. A photograph. The photo was of Michael and some woman. Jessica had seen this woman somewhere. Only she looked different, for she remembered old photos of Michael from his college days showed this woman, but much younger. Jessica hadn't really looked at her husband's old photos, but I think this was the girl she'd seen. She'd have to check. The old albums were stored in the back row of the bookcase. Jessica took out a row of books and pulled out the albums, spreading the albums out on the table. She looked for a picture she honestly didn't remember very well. Okay, something vague like she'd seen. Jessica didn't even really understand why she was doing this. Well, she'd find a picture of a girl, so what? Only that Michael had met somewhere either a classmate or a classmate and had taken a picture with her, but she kept looking for the picture. She thought she'd find it and learn something very important. She did find it. Here is this girl, beautiful with a bold look with some irrepressible energy which is visible even in the old photo. And next to Michael, look so that it is clear is not just love. Here is a passion that will sweep away everything in its path, push on any deeds, Something happened there in the distant past, and now it will auction in the prosperous life of Jessica. She didn't just feel it. She knew it for a fact. The doorbell rang. Emily came in. Over the years, Emily had managed to get married twice and have two children, gain weight, lose weight, gain weight again, but remain her closest friend. Oh, what's this? Nostalgia. What are you doing in the old stuff? You know, it's just a weird picture. Look, here's Michael and his girlfriend, and here's them, but a long time ago. So what? Maybe this one was taken a long time ago, too. It doesn't look like it. Judging by the age, it's done since a year ago. And the shirt he's wearing is the one I bought. 
So this girl showed up again not too long ago. He never told me anything about her. He kept the picture in his pocket. Either it was precious or he was afraid he'd lose it. Or he was afraid I'd see it. Jess, what does that mean? Anything. There's a lot of possibilities. Putting aside the most unpleasant one. The mistress, for example, he met an old love. Well, they took a photo for a good memory, slipped the photo in his pocket and forgot. Inga seems to be trying to calm and cheer up Jessica, offering different options to explain the situation with the photo. And now you can't find a place for yourself and draw horrible pictures of infidelity. By the way, that's also an option. That's exactly how it was planned. I decided to freshen things up, so I planted this picture on you. I wish I had your optimism. What's there to be sad about? It's a tragedy. Even if it's a mistress, it's no big deal. No, you can't forgive, of course. Remember how I kicked my first one out with a kick in the ass? I, but I didn't forgive him. I hate picking up scraps for someone else. Isn't that cheap? I divorced one idiot, found another. Jessica is at a loss to ask her friend for advice on what she should do now. Emily suggests asking Michael directly who the girl in the photo is. But Jessica doubts her husband will tell the truth since he's been silent and acting strangely so far. She feels things are complicated with this girl from the past. Emily insists that they need to find out the truth, even if bitter, rather than hiding their head in the sand. This leads Jessica to the idea of following her husband, although she realizes that it is ugly and dishonest. But if it's impossible to live any other way, then decency will have to be compromised. Jessica still tried to avoid being followed and asked Michael directly about the girl in the old photo. He seemed to remember that it was a certain Sasha with whom he studied together. But after showing the recent photo, Jessica is waiting for an explanation as to why he was recently dating her and carrying the photo in his pocket. The conversation doesn't seem to have cleared things up yet, and Jessica has to decide if it's really worth following her husband to find out the truth. The issue of trust in their relationship hangs in the air. Well, met by chance. Recognized him. Not in the old photo. Then why did you keep her picture? Jess, I'm sorry. Yeah, I know this girl. We had a relationship a long time ago, but that was way before your time. There's nothing to do with us now. Not me. How long ago? What's with the interrogation? I don't want to talk like that. I can go out with old friends. I don't have to ask your permission. Sure, honey. Jessica was sitting in her car outside her husband's office, waiting for something. So he'd get out, so he'd drive. He's got a bunch of auto body shops around town. There's no telling where he'd go. I felt like a fool, but I wouldn't leave. I had to get my mind. I had to follow through. Michael came out, got in the car. Okay, let's go. We drove a short distance and stopped at a coffee shop. Michael went into the cafe. Jessica got out of the car and through the glass tried to see who he came to see. There was no one. He was sitting alone at a table. Jessica cursed herself and got ready to leave. And then she saw her, the girl in the picture. She came into the cafe, sat at Michael's table. Judging by the expression on her face and the abrupt gestures, she said something unpleasant to him. Jessica didn't hear the words, but it seemed to her that Michael was trying to explain something. Maybe to persuade or talk him out of something, but the girl cut him off abruptly. No, not lovers. That's not how lovers behave. What kind of secret is it that you can't tell your wife? The girl left the cafe. Jessica followed her. Why? Something had to be done. She saw her go into the driveway and she drove home. She decided she was going to talk to her husband today. No more secrets, no more innuendo. She had to get it all out in the open. Family's falling apart. There's no room for sentimentality. I used to have a relationship with this woman. Okay, who didn't have a relationship before marriage. What's your connection now? Why is she showing up now? What does she want from you? All the questions had been formulated and asked, but there was no one to answer them. Michael didn't come home. This had never happened before, in their entire married life. Michael had never spent the night out of the house. Jessica was used to falling asleep before her husband arrived, but he was always there in the morning. It was unusual, but she didn't feel any anxiety. She called, no answer. Did you call work? No. They hadn't seen him yet. That's when it started to get unsettling. She called all her friends and acquaintances. No, he didn't spend the night at anyone's house. So where did he sleep over? The one in the picture, Mary Jess. Did you call the police? Emily, what am I supposed to do? My husband's run away. Find him and bring him back. You think he ran away? I don't think so. I think there's trouble. We have to look for your husband who's been running away. Go to the police. The police didn't take a report. 
Oh, come back in three days. He's out on a bender. You're going straight to the police? Jessica tried to explain that her husband does not go out, always sleeps at home. And if he's missing, it means he's in trouble. She must have been too emotional because the policeman behind the glass suddenly said, I understand your husband. I'd run away from such a wife above the Arctic Circle. Come back in three days. Goodbye. Three days to do nothing, then file a report, then wait for someone to do something. What about Michael? Where is he? What happened to him suddenly doesn't matter. Did he cheat? Did he not cheat? What are his terrible secrets? Michael couldn't leave or run away. He was in trouble. There's no other explanation, and no one's going to find out what happened, so I'd have to do it myself. Jessica had no idea how to do that. The only thing that came to mind was to go to Samantha's house. Jessica remembered the house she lived in. Jessica didn't think Michael could be there, but Samantha would explain what their secrets were. Maybe there was at least a clue as to where he was. There was a girl sitting on a bench in the driveway, rocking a baby in a stroller. Uh-huh. Hello. Do you know this woman? Jessica showed me a picture of Samantha. Hey, I can't say I do, but I've seen her. Jessica thanked the girl and called Samantha's apartment. No answer. She called again, but no one was there. Another girl came out of the driveway. She lives alone, has a daughter about 10 years old. They live together. Bree, have you seen this man? Jessica showed a picture of Michael. I don't think so. There was a man who came to see her, but not this one. He came by today looking for her too. I live on the first floor. I can see the entrance from the kitchen. So I saw her yesterday. She went out with her daughter and I don't think she came back. Jessica went home, didn't find out anything, no idea what to do next. She dialed Michael again. No, no answer. There's another girl, 10 years old. If she was 15, I'd think she was Michael's daughter. Then it would make sense what Michael and his ex-lover have in common. But it doesn't make any sense at all. They can't have a 10-year-old daughter in common. There was hope that Michael had come home. But no, he hadn't. Jessica wandered around the empty apartment, then begged for him to come back, then cursed him for doing this to her. I ate that night. Her neighbor at the cottage called, Hey, Jess. Did you have someone staying at the cottage? No. What's wrong, Aunt Maggie? I saw your lights on. I saw them. Michael came by, but he left almost immediately. Are you sure there's someone in the house? I figured if Michael brought it over, it must be someone he knows. Maybe we should go look. Aunt Maggie, please go and call me back right away. Thank God he's alive. Who did he bring in there? Samantha, I guess. But where the hell did he go? He never came home. And why would Samantha hide out at their summer house? So many questions, no one to answer them. The neighbor called Banks. No, Jess, there's a girl there. She wouldn't open the door, but she said she came with her mom. And now her mom's gone for a little while. Hey, nice, should we call the police? No. Uh, Maggie, I think I know who the girl is. I'll be there in the morning. As Jessica drove to the cottage, she couldn't decide how to act. She sees Samantha. And what? Do I ask her outright mistress? And if she was, what would she do? Jessica didn't plan to grab her hair and wrestle her husband back with her fists, nor did she want to leave with her head held high, pretend she'd come by accident. Sure, the husband brought his mistress, and the wife just happened to be passing by. It's like the dumbest joke ever. Okay, I can't think of anything good to say anyway, so we have to act according to the situation. After all, I don't care about Samantha. I need to make sure Michael is okay, Jessica thought. She got out of the car and peered over the fence. The fence was low and not solid. The whole lot was in plain sight. There was a girl sitting at a table under an apple tree. Her blonde hair was in a ponytail, her jeans were a little too big, and she was wearing a plaid shirt. Jessica opened the gate and walked toward the girl. The girl looked up with bright eyes. No fright. Hello. Who are you? I never talk to strangers. Wow. You must have read Hemingway at such a young age. That's a good point. My name is Jessica. This is my cottage, so you're my guest. What's your name? Mary. Mary, are you here all alone? Oh, I'm here with my mom, but she went away for a while yesterday. She's not back yet. Mary, have you seen this man? Jessica showed me a picture of Michael. Of course, that's Uncle Michael. He brought us here, and he came again yesterday. Mom left with him. Very not hungry. No, the fridge is full. Jessica went inside, looked in the fridge. It was full. Sausage, cheese, yogurt, eggs, vegetables. There's chicken in the freezer. Settled in pretty good. They must have been planning on living here. So where's Samantha gone? We can't leave her here alone, can we? Mary, come with me, and we'll leave a note for Mom. 
May Shulzen. Let's go, in case mom doesn't come home tonight. It's scary out here at night. On the way into town, Jessica asked Mary, Mary, where's your daddy? He doesn't live with us. He is a traveler, recently was in Antarctica, and used to work in the circus. He's a magician. Jessica thought the girl chuckled. I see. He traveled to Antarctica and shows tricks to the penguins there. Mary also said that she and her mom often move around. They don't have their own house, but it's even more interesting that way. They lived in Greece for two years. Mary liked it there. It was warm and there was a sea, but her mom said she had to go back. So they came. Mom has a friend in town, Josh. Mary remembers where he lives. We should find him. See if he knows where mom went. But Mary, when you went to the cabin, did mom and Uncle Michael talk about anything? Mom kept saying she was going to go all the way, punish some creep. And Uncle Michael said it was dangerous and we should leave. Well, that's just what I need. Oh, you're in trouble, Michael. What have you done? We're going to have to look for Josh Doe. Maybe he'll clear things up, Jessica thought. Mary showed her the house where Josh lived and said he would be here soon. He always came at the same time. About 10 minutes later, Mary jumped out of the car and, with a shout of Josh, threw herself around the neck of a tall, long-haired young man. Mary, my little monkey, where did you go? Where is Samantha? I haven't been able to find you for two days. He doesn't seem to know much either. But we have to try, Jessica decided. May, uh, I'm Jessica. You see, your Samantha didn't go missing alone, but with my husband. And I found Mary at my cottage. I was hoping you could help me figure it out. You know, I'm having such a crazy day today. I drove home with one thing on my mind, something to eat. There's a diner around the corner. Let's sit down, eat, and try to exchange information. Josh knew Samantha before she went to Greece. Knew she was from Atlanta, was Miss Atlanta. Had a mother there, classmates. She didn't go on to college, got married, had a daughter, then divorced. But it was her ex-husband she had a very complicated relationship with. Josh didn't know exactly, but it seemed to him that her ex-husband had hurt Samantha in some way. She hadn't said much about him, nothing specific, but there was a clear hatred mixed with squeamishness. I'd crush the filthy insect, but I'm disgusted. She'd gone to Greece because she'd been asked to marry there, but the marriage didn't work out, so she came back. It was after she came back that she started acting strange. She was always calling someone, disappearing, throwing jobs at Josh, meeting someone. Josh was happy to help, but he didn't understand how. It's not like she'd let him in on her plans, and now she's missing. And not alone, mind you. I don't understand what my husband has to do with this. We knew each other years ago, but I never heard from her, Jessica said. She's back, and Michael rushed to help her. He was so eager to help her that he forgot to tell me he was leaving. Is she such a fiend fatal that men lose their heads and don't remember themselves? You'd lay down your head if she asked you to? No, Jessica, you're thinking in the wrong direction. There's no reason to be jealous. First of all, she has a policy of no relationships with exes. Never go back in the same river. Secondly, I think she loved her Greek. I don't know what happened between them, but she didn't come back the same. If she found your husband after all these years, she must need him for something. She can't do it without him. I wish I knew what she was up to. Wait, couldn't she have gone back to Austin to see her mom? Or even if she did, she wouldn't have left Mary. She wouldn't even think about her mom. Okay, we can't think of anything now. I'm going to go home, see if I can find out where she lived, who her husband was. Yeah, I'm a lousy friend. It never occurred to me to ask. Well, can you find out? Me. Yeah, I can. Jessica picked up Mary and went home. Interacting with a stranger's child turned out to be quite pleasant. The girl was well-mannered, sociable, well-read, had her own opinion, but all expressed it, sometimes very original. Jess A. For some reason, she immediately began to call Jessica. So, without any aunt, do you have children? No. That's what I'm thinking. You have kids, they grow up. You'll find out you shouldn't have had them. You don't know what you're going to have. That's a very radical decision for a 10-year-old girl. A whole philosophy based on some thoughts, on something seen and heard. It sounds strange coming from the mouth of a child, Jessica thought. But otherwise, Mary was a normal and pleasantly, not at all capricious child. In the morning, Josh called. No, Jessica, I found out something. I gotta go to Austin. I'm leaving tonight. I'll be there tomorrow. I'll ask around, and then I'll be back. Will you keep an eye on Mary? Sure. What'd you find out? Nice. I'm guessing. I'll tell you when I get back. Josh arrived in Austin and the first thing he did was visit Samantha's mother. Old shabby house, 
with an entryway that looked more like a public restroom. The doors are peeling, the door lock falling out of the door. It's unclear how the door even closes. The bell hanging from the wires certainly doesn't work. It's impossible to imagine Samantha living here. Could anyone really live here at all? Josh knocked on the door, not expecting an answer. Suddenly, the door opened. A woman stood in the doorway. Her age wasn't even roughly determinable. The apartment smelled so bad, it made me want to run away. You can't breathe that air. Asking about Samantha here was pointless, but Josh did ask. Samantha's a bitch. I don't think I've ever seen her before. She left my mom. I don't need my mother. I'm dying here all alone. Or do you even know she's got a daughter growing up? I don't want to know. She's an asshole herself, and her daughter will be the same. She's all grown up. Now she's running around with dogs. What? Somebody come looking for Samantha? I did. I told them to get out. She said she'd laid her life on them, and now there's no one to serve her. There's free and slip. She remembered the glass, but not the water, Josh muttered. Oswam staggered, but held on to the door. Careful not to fall. She turned and staggered back into the apartment. Josh closed the door, pushing hard so it wouldn't open, and ran out of the entryway to get a breath of air. Okay, we talked. What a nightmare, he thought, not expecting this. One thing was certain. Samantha would never come back here. Josh's spirits were low after talking to Samantha's mother. She wasn't in Austin. That much was obvious. No one to come back to. But now that he was here, he had to ask around. See if any secrets from the past came out. Went to Samantha's high school. Her homeroom teacher was there. She had no one to talk to but her students. So she gladly told the nice young man about her former... She was a good girl with talent. It's a pity what happened. She went to a beauty contest for some reason. That's when everything started to fall apart. But she was a pretty girl, so why not be a beauty queen? You saw her mother. She's not just a queen. She'd go straight to the bar just to get out of the house. Lena said that after the beauty contest, Samantha was hit on by some daddy from the sponsors, 20 years older than her. She left with him. What happened next, Lena didn't know. Samantha never came to Austin again. You know, her friend Laura lives here. They've been in touch somehow. Laura said Samantha called her. Maybe she knows something. The teacher suggested nothing concrete again, Josh thought. Although he had already guessed which sponsor he was talking about, he learned that Samantha had left Austin with one Michael Lawrence, who was organizing the beauty pageant. He might be Mary's father. Now we have to find Lawrence. But first, we need to talk to Laura, Josh decided. Laura worked at the local hospital. Josh went there. At first, Laura didn't want to talk. She didn't know who this man was or if he might hurt her friend. But Josh turned on all his charm, pressed the fact that Samantha was in danger, and still persuaded his faithful friend. Laura said that after the beauty contest, Samantha was going to leave with Lawrence, and I was horrified. You're going to live with that asshole. He's old, he's ugly, he's got greasy eyes. What am I supposed to do? Stay with my mom, get away from her, and live on your own. But Lawrence is worse than your mother. He'll ruin your life get you into this shit. Age. No, then no. You don't talk. Laura didn't know anything more about Lawrence, but she could feel it, see it. A collector of pretty young fools. Samantha was just another miss to him, but for Samantha, Lawrence was a pass to a new life, and she had spit on everything and left. Laura's surprise was unprecedented when Samantha announced that they were married. Family life had become a dictatorship. You couldn't take a step aside. Endless humiliation, beatings, and total control. How did Samantha manage to have an affair with Michael? It's a mystery, Josh pondered. Michael didn't know that Samantha was married. He fell in love and didn't understand why his beloved would disappear for days at a time, unwilling to move in with him. So mysterious, with a lot of secrets. Lawrence solved all the mysteries quickly. When Samantha said she wanted to leave Lawrence, he didn't object. If you want to go, go, but go where I tell you to go and locked Samantha up in a mental institution for two years. After leaving the asylum, Samantha took a long time to regain consciousness, and when she woke up, she realized she was pregnant. She gave birth to Mary. She didn't care about her life for a long time, but she couldn't imagine her daughter living with this monster. Samantha filed for divorce, grabbed Mary, and ran away. Either Lawrence wasn't omnipotent or he was fed up with his stroppy wife, but they got the divorce. Samantha was afraid that Lawrence would not leave them alone, so she kept moving, calling Laura from different parts of the country. Finally, three years ago, she announced that she had found her happiness fell in love, 
was going abroad and that Lawrence would not bother her there. Sometimes she called, even by video link. Laura could hear Samantha sparkling with happiness and was genuinely happy for her friend, and then she called hysterically, screaming. I'm going to kill that bastard once and for all. He will answer for everything. I did not really understand, but it seems that Lawrence sent her lover photos of beaten Samantha in the asylum and after, and wrote that he was going to marry a vicious woman. And in the photos where Samantha was drugged, with a glazed look, she really looked terrible. Apparently, Hiroshima, as she was the Greek believed, was afraid to connect fate with such a person or was not so much in love. Anyway, Samantha had to grab her daughter again and leave. That's all I know. I haven't called again, and thank you, Laura. That clears things up. If he shows up, give me a call. Josh called Jessica, said he couldn't find out anything more in Austin. And he'll be home tomorrow morning. No, Josh, you're coming straight to my place. You'll tell me everything. But if you feed me breakfast, I'll come straight to you from the train. In the morning, Jessica was awakened by the doorbell. Woke her up at the moment when she was dreaming of something nasty and disturbing. She had no strength to wake up and open her eyes. It's a good thing they woke her up. It must be Josh, Jessica thought, but it was Ingrid. Aren't you answering your phone? Michael's here? No, she came in like a hurricane. Her energy hadn't diminished over the years. Emotions are running high. Hey, don't yell. The baby's sleeping. Please. What baby? Where did you get a baby? Let's go to the kitchen. Have some coffee and I'll tell you all about it. I've got breakfast to make. Josh will be here in a minute. He eats so much I'm afraid I can't feed him. Jessica could hardly contain her laughter. Ingrid's amazed face was so funny. I'm sorry and I'll just get you a coffee. I didn't have time to go to the store. A man needs to be fed. No offense, girlfriend. Jessica couldn't take it anymore and laughed. Come on, I'll find you a sandwich, too, before Josh arrived. Jessica had just enough time to tell him where the girl and the man had come from. Ingrid Utate and Ahedi. Jessica thought she was more interested in who Josh was than anything else in the story. You're not getting married for the third time, are you? Looking for a candidate. She joked. Josh arrived, tired, hungry, upset. Everything I'd learned didn't help me figure out where Samantha and Michael were, Josh summarized. Knowing Samantha's character, I fear that she's decided to take revenge on Lawrence. Self-hatred and fear for her daughter might have pushed her to rash actions. It's too expensive to compete with Lawrence, Ingrid said. He's in the upper echelon of show business. Rich, famous, surrounded by stars and the right people. Invulnerable and all-powerful. You can't get to him. And if you do, it's a head-scratcher. Ex-wife is not the kind of character he'd feel sorry for. He'll either kill her or put her away. What happens to Mary, then? It's interesting that everyone's worried about Samantha and Mary. Does anyone wonder what will happen to Michael? Jessica grinned bitterly. No one cares. It's his own fault, I see. I shouldn't have gotten involved in someone else's story. But if I did, I'd like to see him get out of it unscathed. At least alive, Jessica didn't know how to deal with her husband when he came back. Or rather, if he did. What kind of love was so abnormal if after all these years he spits on our prosperous family life and gets involved in some adventure? Samantha may not be going into the same river. Michael, on the other hand, seems to be hoping for something. There's no other explanation, she thought bitterly. Does he intend to go back to Jessica? If so, how? Will he come and, without explaining or telling her anything, go on with his normal life as if nothing had happened? Does he think he can do that? Ingrid wondered. Jessica didn't know if she wanted her husband back. The only thing she wanted now was for him to be alive. We'll see. Our detective work has reached a dead end, Josh stated. Samantha's secrets are solved. Michael has no secrets. Where do we go from here? Josh felt that the only way forward was to dig into Lawrence's life. If something unforeseen, unpleasant for him, had happened in the last few days, it was likely that our vigilantes had sprung into action as soon as possible. They must be stopped before the trouble happens. I'm going to go home now, get some sleep, and find out what Lawrence is up to, what's going on. Josh, who are you? If you can find out what the powerful are up to, Ingrid was clearly interested in the young man. I'm not a big bird myself, Josh answered modestly. But I have a few friends, including some from the world of show business who, I think, may be aware of Lawrence's affairs. If I hear anything, I'll call you, Josh added. Don't hurt Mary. She's a good girl. 
where Josh left and Jessica and Ingrid were left to ponder what kind of revenge Samantha had planned, but trying it on for size. What would you do if your husband ruined your life? Ingrid asked. Well, I'd probably do nothing. I'd try to forget it like a bad dream, replied Jessica, and I'd definitely take revenge. How can you send your current wife a photo of you with your mistress? You can put your story in the press, ruin your image. But it's all kind of petty, toothless, Ingrid sighed. She didn't have the imagination for anything else. Jessica enjoyed spending the day with Mary. They went to the mall and bought Mary some clothes. She didn't even have any pajamas and only one shirt. They went to a cafe, had ice cream, then bought groceries and went home to make lunch or dinner. Josh was supposed to be here with news. And Ingrid, of course, would not stay home. While cooking dinner and talking to Mary, Jessica couldn't get the thought of her husband out of her head. Angry, of course, but even angrier at the unknown Samantha. Revenge on an ex-husband is probably fair, but why bring my Michael into it? She thought bitterly. Look, but how can you not think about how your gamble will turn out for other people? For Michael and Jessica, Josh and friend Laura see Samantha as an innocent victim, hurt and humiliated. Jessica didn't see it that way. She developed a very different image of herself over the days. Bold, bossy, unforgiving of insults and insults, willing to go to extremes. Surely there was something to avenge Lawrence. But Jessica also questioned the extent of his guilt, the ease with which Samantha had put other people's lives on the line, including her own daughters, was astonishing. In the evening, they gathered the council, and Josh laid out what they'd learned. Lawrence was really getting into trouble. A seemingly small thing at first. His young wife, an aspiring singer whom no one had heard yet, had been sent a photo of her husband having fun with his mistress. The mistress is even younger and, apparently, even more eager to become a star. Otherwise cannot explain the popularity of the old worldly daddy of young girls. But the young wife turned out to be wise beyond her years. She didn't want Lawrence's love. She didn't marry for that until he made a singer out of her. No divorce is out of the question. She didn't notice the affair, and there was no scandal. If Samantha did it, the first blow missed. The second one was much more serious. Lawrence's production center was churning out stars like pies. Not a year without a star. If they're making stars, somebody wants them. It was needed by sponsors who invested a lot of money and wanted a lot of money in retaliation. Their indignation was not limit when they learned that most of the money Lawrence spends not on the promotion of stars, but on himself, his favorite. These were not empty words. They were presented with documents and proof of how much and on what was spent. The production center was cracking at the seams. Sponsors demanded Lawrence return the money, and the underachieving stars realized that fame was passing them by. Apparently, Samantha had been preparing this blow for a long time and disappeared when she was ready to deliver it. Realized, that the collapse of Lawrence's career will not forgive her. Oh my God, what was she hoping for? That Lawrence would bitch and not find out who star- Now Jessica was horrified. But the worst part was that Michael would be the one to retaliate. She no longer doubted that he was involved. It was unlikely he was helping Samantha get information not his level, but he was hiding it from Lawrence. That was a fact. No, Jess, don't panic. Josh saw that Jessica was on the verge of a breakdown. We're not even sure what Samantha did. Somewhere she must have gotten those documents and her entourage. I haven't found any people working at the Lawrence Center, although I don't know much about her at all, Josh added. Ingrid entered the room with a cup of coffee. Jess, do you have anything stronger? Coffee's a little hard to get through in here. She must have realized that Lawrence was going to retaliate now. Did she really think she'd spend the rest of her life in hiding? I don't see what she stands to gain by raising Lawrence to the ground now. On the contrary, he is now her personal enemy, Ingrid wondered. Was revenge so much in her eyes that she did not think of Mary? I don't understand why she didn't think of her daughter either. Josh seemed to doubt Samantha's infallibility. Let's have a drink. Mm. Jessica put the cognac on the table. Mm. Explain to me what to do. My husband is missing, by the way. It's been three days, but there's no point in going to the police. As it turned out, He's not missing, but ran away with some inadequate girl involved in some strange affairs. So what do I do? Everyone sat silent, drinking, thinking. Ingrid thought it was necessary to wait for Michael's return. He'll be back someday. He'll explain everything. Josh wanted to find Samantha's informants to see where she got her information. How much truth there was out there. Thorns will lie low now, but he'll surface later. Sooner rather than later. 
Good things like this don't sink. We need to understand the extent of the damage and assess how angry he is. What kind of retaliation might be necessary? Jessica had her own plan. To meet with Lawrence and get his opinion of Samantha, his assessment of all the events. She suspected that Lawrence had a completely different perspective on what had happened. Jessica summarized. It was agreed. Ingrid would stay home and look after Mary. What if Michael showed up? Josh finds out how badly Lawrence was hurt and what the threat to Samantha is. Jessica makes direct contact with Lawrence and tries to find out what he thinks about Samantha and recent events. Truthfully, how to get close to the producer, she didn't know. He's not likely to open up about his personal life to the first woman he meets. No. Why don't you pretend to be a journalist? Josh suggested it. That would be the worst. He's as scared as hell of journalists these days, Ingrid objected. Maybe you're Samantha's lawyer and you want to settle before the trial. Josh came up with an idea. First of all, no one was suing. Second, having a lawyer is practically an admission of guilt. And we're not sure that it was Samantha who attacked Lawrence. Jessica countered. He's got plenty of well-wishers without her. Maybe he's not even thinking about her and we'll hand him the guilty party on a silver platter. Then he'll be all over her, Ingrid concluded, unable to think of anything. Jessica drove to the Lawrence Center. The main thing is to see him, and the rest will follow, she decided. As expected, she couldn't get past the guards. Not surprisingly, in light of recent events, Miss Lawrence doesn't see anyone. No new projects, no appointments either. So barricaded. It's impossible to get through. Okay, let's go the other way, Jessica thought. She knew what Lawrence looked like. The media personality scandal was all over the TV channels. Feeling is he going to come out of the center someday? Clearly, they won't let him near me. I have to think of a way to get his attention to say something so that Lawrence will realize it's in his best interest to talk to me. She sat on the bench in front of the office, fretting, trying to think of the right phrase to get Lawrence's attention. She had several options. But when Lawrence appeared in the doorway, she was suddenly confused, and everything she'd thought of went out of her head. He was walking toward the car and now he would get in and drive away. She had to say something. Jessica rushed to the car and shouted, Lawrence, tell me about Samantha. She's going to ruin my husband. The guards rushed toward her, but Lawrence suddenly stopped them. He looked at Jessica carefully and waved his hand, beckoning her over. When she approached, he asked, D, do you know Samantha? No, I've never seen her. What does this have to do with my husband? He left with her. Why don't you get in the car and we'll talk? Don't worry, I don't eat beautiful women for lunch. Jessica knew her value and had long ago realized how it worked on men. But now a chill ran down her spine. She felt scared and a little creepy. She was scared, but she couldn't back down, so she got into the car. Nay, hey, take it easy. After all, I'm not the one who came to see you. You're the one who wants something from me, Lauren said. Now I want to hear your side of the story. What's your husband's name? I want to know about Samantha. I know her version of events from her friend's words, but I don't believe it too much. I want to understand what my husband's gotten himself into. Me, where is he now? Michael, Guns approached the driver. That's what I'm trying to find out. I'm truly sorry if your husband got involved with Samantha. Nothing good can come of it for you or him. And, uh, Jessica, no, Walter, the girl and I are having a serious conversation. Not the car version. Let's go to the restaurant. What's your name, really? What's ours? At the restaurant, Lawrence was greeted like a regular. You know, Jessica, I probably should have told you this a long time ago. I didn't want to be a pain in the ass. I'll tell you, I feel sorry for you and for myself. I'm tired of being the bad guy. Believe it or not, it's up to you. But maybe confessing to a villain will help you. For some reason, I want to help you. I didn't expect myself to be so sentimental. I hope I won't regret it. And I hope I don't have to tell you it's not for the press or Jessica. Would you like anything? Me. Here's your table, as usual. Lawrence's version was radically different from what Jessica had heard. The only thing they had in common was that they met in Austin at a beauty pageant. Samantha immediately figured out on whom the title of Queen depends and did everything to get this title. No, I'm not here to eat. Go ahead. He began cheating on Samantha almost immediately. Lawrence knew about it, but asked him not to make it public. He knew perfectly well that married to a young girl it was foolish to demand fidelity. He does not need fidelity. He needs a beautiful picture of a happy family life of a famous producer. Am I asking too much for the money I'm giving you? You could have portrayed a happy wife, he resented. 
She was not embarrassed by the age of the prince and his frankly shabby appearance. She wanted to escape from the family and Lawrence was the springboard. He himself didn't realize how she'd spun him. He'd seen so many in his bed that another one seemed like a passable option. But that wasn't the case. Samantha had a beastly grip. The producer couldn't break free. After all, you have to get married, and the image of a married man will play into the hands. The girl is beautiful, not stupid. Let it be her. If I had known how it would end, I would have married a fool. Lawrence grinned bitterly. Samantha, a little imitation, and then went off the rails. Michael was the first call. Before him, there were many young and different, but it was all entertainment. But Michael was serious. She even talked about divorce. Lawrence didn't object. He was sick of it. He just asked her to wait a little longer. He was finishing up a project. Didn't want to give the press a reason to gossip. I thought it was settled. But apparently, there was someone else besides Michael. Lawrence noticed that Samantha began to behave inadequately. She sleeps all day, then cries, then pounces on him with fists. Strange behavior was increasingly conspicuous. What is most unpleasant? Not only Lawrence, whose worst fears had come true. Samantha was taking drugs. Lawrence panicked, couldn't let the news get out. He treated her in secret, so God forbid anyone found out. He took his wife to an expensive closed hospital, which kept the secrets of clients more than an Samantha was treated well there. She came back completely sane, behaved herself. If she had cheated, Lawrence didn't know it now. He didn't need anything else. We live normally. We observe decency and all right, he reasoned. When Samantha announced that she was pregnant, he calmed down. Everyone's calmed down. She will give birth to a child at least some time to stay at home. Look, and everything will improve. Hope Lawrence. But it wouldn't. In vain, he hoped immediately after Mary's birth. Samantha's mission, accomplished sign, lit up in front of her. Nothing was holding her back anymore. She threw tantrums, screaming that she didn't want to live with such an ugly, fat, disgusting man. Well, if you don't want to, don't live. All fed up, break up. You aren't decided. He bought an apartment, deposited a huge sum of money, and got divorced. Michael, wait. Something does not add up. Hmm. Interrupted him, Jessica. If she had an apartment, why was she traveling all over the country? Why was she hiding from you? Very original hiding, Lawrence grinned. Mm, calling from everywhere, yelling that I'd put her and her daughter in another hole, demanding money. I sent more than what I'd left in the divorce and had already transferred. Over the years, you could live in your own villa somewhere in the Maldives. Why did you send the pictures to Greece? Jessica asked. I didn't send anything, Lawrence said. I was glad she had settled down. I hoped she'd stay there longer. I was willing to keep paying to get her off my back. But I guess she showed her true colors there, too. The Greeks kicked her out. Back in the States, Samantha took revenge on Lawrence. But he didn't know why. Whether she hired detectives or many friends, she tracked down Lawrence and his mistress. The new young wife was unimpressed by the news. She's got her own nose to the grindstone. And she wasn't interested in Lawrence as a man, only as a sponsor. Where and with whom he partied, it didn't matter. When Samantha got to the financial documents, Lawrence was angry. Why bite the hand that feeds you? If I go broke, Samantha will be out of money too. At least think of your daughter, he resented. Lawrence tolerated cheating and everything else. But when his life's work was at stake, there was no room for pity. He was determined to stop Samantha. Sure, she's messed up my life, but it's not critical. I'm not an invertebrate amoeba that's so easy to snack on. I'll get my name and influence back, Lawrence pondered. I haven't figured out what to do about Samantha yet. I know where your husband is. He really is with her. But don't be frightened. I'm not going to do anything to them. I'm not a gangster from the 90s. I have no beef with Michael at all. Samantha's always had a way with men. I'm a case in point. But I don't know how to stop her. I can't lock her up in a hospital. Wait, Michael, but she's got your daughter with her. What's going to happen to her? Jessica asked worriedly. I never believed she was my daughter, but it doesn't matter. I'm her father on paper. I have no other children, and Mary is a wonderful girl. Hey, did you have any contact with her? Mary was little, and her mom was traveling around, and sometimes she'd leave her with me for a month or two. When Mary got older, Samantha stopped leaving her. I guess she was afraid I'd refuse to take her back someday. Somehow I'd have to explain to the girl who I was. So don't worry about Mary. 
I'll be happy to have her live with me, Lauren said. Jessica's head was spinning. She did not know who to believe. In front of her sat an old, ugly, and unhappy man with tired eyes. A lot of work, a lot of money, and no happiness in the past or in the future. Could she trust him? Somehow, she believed he wouldn't hurt Michael. He doesn't want Michael. He'd let him go. But what about Samantha? Or is Lawrence not telling the truth? Why would he? He could just not tell his story to a woman he doesn't know. Or is Samantha really sick? You don't make up a creepy husband story like that in your right mind. Michael, I'm not asking what you're going to do. You're not going to tell me. But one last question. Why did you marry again to a young poor girl with ambition, who sees in you only a bag of money? Jessica asked, you can't believe that she loves you. Why do you have to go through this again? Jessica wondered, no, the rake? It's not the same, Lawrence grinned. My present wife does not love me, of course. I know all about myself and look in the mirror. But it's not Samantha. Just a young, stupid hick who wants fame. As soon as success looms, she'll dump me and never remember me again. Yet smart and calculating Samantha goes a long way. The truth is, I'm beginning to think Samantha's not well. I don't know why she's getting back at me. It's like a mania. She's always had a lot on her mind. But now her cockroaches are just running wild. Jessica felt sorry for the poor man. Money really isn't everything, she thought. Yes, he's not white and fluffy, but he's not a villain who gets his ex-wife. It seemed to Jessica that he felt sorry for his wife, albeit ex-wife, and his daughter, albeit not his own. Jessica had heard everything she wanted to hear. She didn't know where Michael was, but she knew he was safe. No, so he'd be back soon. Okay, we'll meet him, Jessica said. Breeze had she was about to leave. But Lawrence suddenly said, Jessica, you are a very beautiful woman. I was looking at you and thinking, do you know where I've seen you? I know in an old French movie. You're not from here. You're from over there. Don't be frightened. I'm not going to charm you. You're not my type. I guess it's none of my business, but Michael's out of your league, too. He's not worthy of you. How many years have you wasted on him? Isn't that enough? There's still time for you to be happy. Do you really love him? I'm sorry to be so frank. You don't love him. Then why do you love him? Look at me. You're looking at a man who thinks he can live without love. Don't make the same mistakes I did. Be happy. Ashwika was leaving, he said to her. Remember, my story mustn't get out. If anything appears in the press, I'll know you did it. You're the only person I've ever spilled my guts to. I warn you, if you do, I'll be your personal enemy. It was harsh and demanding. Jessica drove home in the morning, replaying the information in her head. It didn't make sense. Now, Josh was going to say that Samantha was the victim of a tyrant husband. Jessica didn't believe that anymore. He's not a tyrant, just an unhappy man who makes money but realizes he can't buy happiness with it. I feel sorry for him, but I pity myself even more. I've spent half my life trying to build a happy family. And where is it? Some lunatic lured Michael in and he ran after her, forgetting he had a family. Well, that's a family that's worthless. It's time to take my head out of the sand, Jessica pondered. The house was packed. They sat worried blaming themselves for letting Jessica go alone. They were terribly glad that she had returned alive and unharmed. Jessica carefully, without elaboration, spilled all the information. As expected, Josh didn't believe it. For Jess, you're a smart woman. How could he woo you so quickly? Hmm. Josh, what do you know besides what Samantha said about herself? Her friend Lena, who believes Samantha is the victim of a tyrant husband, hasn't seen her either. You can say anything on the phone. How do you check? I'm not saying that everything Lawrence said is true. But the image of your infallible Samantha has gotten a little fuzzy, Jessica said. Lingrid, sensing the growing disagreement, quickly intervene. Nice, break. What are you arguing about? If I understand correctly, there are no complaints about Michael. Then Casanova will be here soon. We'll ask him. But when you think about it, your Samantha is kind of weird. Don't you think so, Josh? Josh didn't say anything, but he didn't deny it. Samantha was a friend, of course, and he was willing to help her. But lately, he wished she'd go away. I'm not refusing to help. Distance is not an obstacle, he thought. They agreed that Michael was safe and would be back soon. Samantha was lying a lot, but Lawrence wasn't going to take revenge on her. Everything seemed fine, but Jessica didn't care about Michael or Samantha. She didn't know what to do with her life. Had she loved Michael when she got married? Of course she did. He was so handsome. Her heart sank, the thin, intelligent face, the suave manners. Now Jessica was asking herself, 
Is this enough for a happy life? Well, you're so wise now. And then such questions did not occur to you. Yes, if youth knew. And it's too early to talk about old age. Well, amateur detectives. Any thoughts on what to do next? Jessica asked. No, I don't. It's a dead end. I mean, it's all so clear, but what's the point? I don't know where Samantha is. Why isn't Michael coming back? It doesn't make sense, the other said. Jessica wanted to lie down and think. The wisest thoughts come to her before she sleeps. Her dear guests, don't you have to go? She hinted. Ingrid and Josh didn't object. Now, yes, it's time, they said and hurriedly got ready. Wow, I missed something. Ingrid, what a bitch. How did she get here so fast? She's always been like that, though, and no one can keep up, Jessica thought. She lay down, but she couldn't sleep. She thought about her life. It was strange to think of her life with Michael as something that had passed. She had never imagined living without him. Now I'd have to get used to it. It was terribly depressing. When he came back, he'd probably explain everything, apologize. But Jessica wouldn't be able to live with him, to pretend that nothing had happened. She can't. She'll always remember the betrayal. I wonder if he'll tell the truth or lie. Jessica pondered. Michael showed up the next day. He came over, kissed her cheek carelessly, looked into her eyes, tried to understand what was waiting for him and how to behave. Nay, Jess, I'm sorry. I had a work emergency. I had to leave, and I broke my phone accidentally, so I couldn't call. Okay, I'm gonna lie. Of course, no one has a phone but yours, Jessica said sarcastically. Michael, before you tell a bunch of lies, I want to tell you that I've been looking for you. I was at the cottage. I know about Samantha. Her daughter's sleeping in the bedroom. By How'd you leave that girl alone? Samantha never remembered her until now. Also, keep in mind that I saw Lawrence. He told me his side of the story. So without humiliating yourself by lying, why do you care so much about Samantha that you got involved in a murky story and weren't afraid to lose your family? Michael must have come up with some story that was convenient for him, but Jessica messed up his plans and he had no choice but to tell the truth. It's unclear how much she knows, but it's dangerous to get caught in a lie. I don't know how to explain it, Michael began. When I saw her, I knew I couldn't say no. I knew she was dragging me into something bad, but she needed help. You know, it was like a spell, like hypnosis. She was so convincing about Lawrence's abuse, or so his meanness. I didn't even doubt it was true. The only thing I could do was try to talk it out, to dismiss it. I was afraid it would be worse. Well, to be perfectly honest, I chickened out. I knew it would be bad for me, too. Samantha showed up when she got back from Greece. We saw each other occasionally. She told me more and more details about Lawrence's abuse. Michael believed her. His heart broke with pity for the fragile, unhappy, unjustly accused of all the sins of a woman. Michael was eager to help, rushing to every call. Then he got tired of rushing. More and more often flashed the thought that before her appearance he lived a normal, quiet life and would not mind to return to such a life. But now Samantha wouldn't let go, calling, sobbing, demanding help. The last call was hysterical. Her husband had figured out where she lived. She had to run, but she had nowhere to go. Michael rushed to Samantha's apartment. She was frantically shoving things into her bag, pushing her daughter. Hurry, 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 hurry. He'll be here any minute. I've got so much dirt, he won't get away with it. He'll answer for everything. Mary, don't poke around. Put those toys down. Come on, let's go. As Michael drove them to the cottage, Samantha talked excitedly about how she would exact revenge on Lawrence. Michael tried to talk her out of it, begging her to give it up. It was too dangerous. Different weight classes. If you piss Lawrence off, he'd retaliate in a way that would be devastating. Samantha couldn't hear, screaming that no one understood how much she'd suffered at the hands of this man. For a moment, Michael thought she wasn't quite right. She kept saying Lawrence was stalking her. But in the time he'd been with her, Michael had never seen him. Not even a phone call. On the contrary, it seemed as if Samantha was stalking her ex-husband. Some kind of obsessive stalking. It's unclear who's after whom, Michael continued. We're tired of Samantha's inadequacy. He tried to convince her to leave. He promised to find a safe place. Now, if there's no money to move, I will. That's the kind of money he offered. Jessica laughed. The laugh was hearty and a little hysterical. The money she'd scraped out of Lawrence was enough for three lifetimes. You'll never make that much. Jess, please stop humiliating me. I know I was a fool to fall for it. I don't know what it was. It was an obsession. Yeah, it was an obsession. 
Hypnosis. The evil eye. Isn't that a little too mystical? What kind of hypnosis did you forget about me under? Do you have any idea what I went through when you disappeared? I was sure you were in trouble. I was ready to tear up those policemen who sneered at me. They said your husband was out and would come back. I didn't think you'd just run off with your mistress. Why did you come back? Did not like living with a crazy woman? Mm -hmm. Jessica continued. May. Jess, I'm sorry. No. No, I'm not. Keep talking. Why didn't you leave her at the cottage? You knew by then she was safe. Let her live. You could have come home and told me everything. Didn't you ever think of that simple option? That's what I was going to do, but it didn't work out. I didn't get home in time, Michael explained. Samantha called again and demanded that I go back to the cottage. She said that I had to go to some acquaintances who had obtained material on Lawrence. They're willing to leak it online, but they need to be paid. We have to do it now. Sir Lawrence will be unstoppable. Why he obeyed again, Michael did not understand. But he turned around and drove to the cottage. Samantha was already at the fence. She jumped into the car. Let's go, she commanded. Michael was still trying to appeal to her maternal sensibilities. Race. Who's the girl going to stay with? Michael didn't listen. They drove for a long time. Samantha was agitated and impatient. All the time pushing Michael, she said with gloating. That's it, he's finished. That's it now. As they were thrashing around, it was scary. Samantha's behavior seemed too strange to Michael. At some point, he had a sense of unreality about what was happening. He couldn't believe he was participating in this absurdity. What am I doing here? Why am I doing this? He thought. When they arrived, Samantha told Michael to wait and walked into the entryway. He sat waiting, lost track of time, didn't realize how long he had been here. But for some reason, he wouldn't leave. He remembered Jessica, tried to think of how he would explain himself to her. There was a longing in his soul, and he wanted to leave everything and return to his quiet, happy life. Despair was setting in. Michael realized that his life would never be the same. But he didn't leave. He waited. He woke up when he realized that he had been sitting for hours. He called Samantha, but she didn't answer. So Michael got out of the car, stood, walked over, and went into the driveway. Where to find Samantha, he had no idea. He decided to knock on all the doors one by one. A grandmother who looked like a fairy flower with pink hair slowly descended the stairs. She was followed by a small dog that looked just like her, only not pink. Michael still dared to ask her if she had seen the girl in the light-colored jacket and where she might have gone. Young man, even if I seem strange to you, you could have said hello. I haven't seen your girlfriend, but there is one apartment on the fifth floor where many people go in, but few come out. Look for her there, she replied. Who the hell is she, a witch? Michael thought as he walked up to the fifth floor. He didn't even have to think about which door was which. One was half open. Entering, he found himself in a narrow hallway with flickering lights and peeling wallpaper. As he walked further down, he saw a large room with about 10 people in it. Some sitting, some lying down, and some walking back and forth. No one paid Michael any attention, as if he didn't exist. A kind of looking glass opened before him. Michael had never seen such a place before, but he immediately recognized the essence of what was happening. He tried to see who could be Samantha. He found her picked her up in his arms and headed for the exit. The others showed no interest in who was being carried, where they were being carried. Their gazes were blank, as if they saw nothing around them. Putting Samantha in the back seat of the car, Michael got behind the wheel and realized he didn't know where he was going, probably to the hospital. But if Samantha was taken there, he would be locked up in a treatment facility. What would become of Mary then? And what would happen to him when Samantha found out that he was the one who sent her there? Without medical attention, she could die. Michael dialed the number of a doctor he knew, gave the address of Samantha's last refuge, and drove to the location. The doctor arrived quickly, treated Samantha, gave her shots, put her on an IV, and said that the patient needed constant supervision. He took a fee for his services and left. Michael was left alone. Sitting next to a nearly motionless Samantha, he thought about how it was that his life had descended to this. He wished he could get rid of all his troubles and go back to his wife. It was clear to him that Jessica was unlikely to forgive him. He wondered how he'd gotten himself into all this. At first, old feelings flared up. After all, he remembered how strong love had once been. Then came the desire to prove himself a hero, the savior of his beloved from the encroachments of the villain. When he realized that the princess was independent enough to fend for herself, it was too late to change anything. 
He found himself too deeply involved in the situation. He would have continued to sit next to Samantha, tormented by thoughts of rescue. But suddenly there was a call from Lawrence. Not to Michael, of course, but to Samantha. But Michael answered. Silently, without explanation, Lawrence said that Michael could be out. He would look after Samantha himself. Michael didn't object. He left the place in a hurry, and there he was, standing there so familiar and close. He's back. First he left her, now Samantha. I can see why he left Samantha. Things had gotten too tense, too tiring. Tired of having to sacrifice himself. I longed to return to my youth, to relive the vivid feelings. But I couldn't. A life of mixed fantasies was too disturbing. What was wrong with Jessica? Jessica looked at Michael with difficulty, and inside her flared the desire to strike him in his graceful, cultured face. The face that had always been so neat, to make his appearance distorted with pain, to make him cease to be attractive, to make her have no desire to admire him, no desire to rejoice in his return. Wanted to rid herself of any warm feelings for him. He didn't deserve it. But she held back. I didn't hit him. Michael didn't even realize how deeply he'd hurt her. How could he do that? He didn't think about how much it hurt her. How skillfully he'd packaged his anger in an attractive shell. Look how honest I've been. I didn't lie. I came and told her the truth. And now he's standing there looking at me and doesn't understand what the problem is. After all, he came back, told everything, repented, even asked for forgiveness. And Jessica should have forgiven him as a sign of gratitude for the fact that he came back and felt pity for her poor husband, who had been through so much. She should have thrown herself into his arms with tears in her eyes, stroked his head and assured him that everything terrible was over and everything would be all right. Jessica stood motionless, her gaze glassy, sending shivers down Michael's spine. She was silent, and he couldn't understand her thoughts. Obviously, a quick reconciliation scene with a happy resolution was not going to work out. Michael decided to wait it out. He hadn't even considered the idea that Jessica wouldn't forgive him, not now or ever in the future. And Jessica's only wish seemed to be that this man was never around again, that he would leave and never show up again. Will you please leave now? She said, trying to remain calm. What do you mean, leave? Where am I going? Michael didn't understand. Get out of here. Go away. Get out. Shouted Jessica, already desperate. Michael was stunned. Never before had he seen his tactful and calm wife in such a furious state. He was scared and confused. Michael realized it was time to leave before her condition turned into a full-blown tantrum. He couldn't imagine how this explosion of emotion might end and he didn't want to find out. Okay, I'll stay at the cottage for now. Then we'll talk, he said as he made his way outside. When the door closed behind Michael, Jessica couldn't hold back any longer and burst into tears. Mary, peering into the room fearfully, cautiously walked over and hugged her. Jessica, do you want me to get you some tea? You cry for a while and I'll put the kettle on, she offered affectionately. Something clenched in Jessica's heart. Perhaps for the first time she realized that she wished she had a child, someone to help her cope with the pain and give her the strength to go on living. But right now, she felt alone. Jessica tried to do something to take her mind off the pain, but the tears wouldn't stop flowing. It was like she was trying to cry out all the loneliness and pain of the last few days. Mary, without imposing, came in from time to time to see if everything was all right, realizing that Olga needed space. In the evening, Emily's friend came in and, seeing Jessica's condition, picked her up in a friendly manner and took her into the kitchen. While Jessica sat there, Emily quickly set the table, poured a shot of cognac and asked her friend to drink, trying to support her in some way and help her overcome her grief. Okay, well, now eat and tell me about it, Emily suggested. Barely holding back tears, Jessica began the story of her husband's return. Emily, tell me, do men think differently? He told me everything. Look, I still don't understand what happened, and I can see he's not faking it. He really doesn't understand. Can I live with him? Look, friend, divorce is not a disaster. Emily reassured her, I'm speaking as someone who's been through it. Don't rush to make a decision on emotion. When we were young, we were all categorical, but now sometimes compromise seems to be the best solution. Everything needs to be well thought out and stop crying. Emily said very warmly. In my case, compromise is not an option, Jessica countered. After all, I don't love Michael. Or maybe I never have. Do you think it's because of him that I'm crying? No, I'm crying for me. I feel sorry for myself. How ridiculous my life has been. No love, no children. Now no husband, Jessica, drowned in her self-pity, 
tears flowing. Friends exist to support you, to tell you that you are a good girl, to wipe away your tears and add a little cognac. That's what they did. Gradually, the dialogue descended to the usual complaints of resentful women. We are so beautiful and smart, we earn our own money, but we are not lucky in our personal lives. Where do men look? And in fact, where are these men? I guess they are no longer around. This conversation continued along the well-known route. How bad men are and how unfair life is to them. Here I am, a fool admired, always for a great love married in for life. But you chose Michael for his reliability, stability, and the chance to live without concussions. Was I wrong? Did you miss something about him? Or is it your own fault? Over He'd come to believe that I wouldn't go anywhere, that I'd keep everything simple. In the end, he became the husband I raised him to be. So what? We're going to blame ourselves now. You're not the one who got involved with the ex. No, you left when you realized she wasn't herself. You didn't get involved in a risky venture to ruin Lawrence, Emily said indignantly. And you didn't decide that despite having a family, she was the one to save. Come to your senses, friend, and stop defending that scoundrel. Maybe you're even thinking of forgiving him. You can try, but it won't do you any good. It's scary to be alone at 40, isn't it? Isn't it scarier to look him in the eye every day, expecting another betrayal, than about being alone? You know I have some thoughts, she added. Are you out of your mind or what? What options are there in my position? Jessica interjected. We'll see about that, Emily exclaimed confidently. I myself once thought there was no choice, but it turns out there is. Inga was talking with such gusto about Josh's charms, his politeness, his intelligence, his beauty, that Jessica realized that her friend had been carried away again. How can you believe after a couple days of knowing him that he's the one for you? He didn't teach you the first time, and now it's like a fresh start again into everything in the world without a backward glance. Jessica envied Emily in her own way. I wish I could be like that, maybe sometime in the future, but not now. Right now, I have to get a divorce, sell the apartment, split things. It's all so painful and unpleasant. I didn't think life could turn out like she thought. You can still turn it around, pretend you've forgiven. Go on living a measured, unhappy, but peaceful life. Not ready for change, though it often comes unexpectedly. While Emily dreamed of her happiness, Jessica pondered how loneliness was saved. At least she's got kids. And here she was, lonely. Speaking of children, oh my God, where's Mary? Jessica exclaimed fearfully and hurried into the room. Mary was asleep, tired after a long day. Jessica, did you feed her today? Emily inquired. No, you didn't. Jessica smiled. She was the one who gave me tea and brought me sandwiches, keeping an eye on me to make sure I didn't do anything stupid. Strange, with a mom like that and a nomadic life. Mary is a perfectly adequate child, Jessica reasoned, and now her mom will probably have to go into rehab. What's going to happen to Mary? No one seems to take much interest in her fate. Yeah, it's weird, Emily agreed. You know, we should get going. She pulled out her cell phone and dialed a number girlfriend. Can you pick me up at Jessica's? Thanks. Emily sent the photo and smiled at the response. What tenderness. Gone? Well, at least you'd be happy. The next morning, Mr. Lawrence himself called Jessica. He invited, or rather announced, that he was expecting her for lunch and the car would arrive at the appointed time. Jessica felt anxious. It was clear what the conversation would be about. Or rather, about whom? About whom? About Mary. Jessica thought that now her daughter would be discussed and she herself meant nothing to Lawrence. It was sad to part with a girl who had been such a comfort to her during the last few days, but her feelings were apparently unimportant. The meeting took place again in a restaurant where a polite waiter again greeted them and Lawrence, who had aged noticeably during these days. Hello, Jessica. It's good to see you. You won't believe this, but in the last few days, you are the first person I've had a pleasant conversation with. The others are either sympathetic or mean. Michael, may I ask how Samantha is doing? Jessica asked hesitantly. Michael told her that after Michael left, he went to Samantha's house. He found her in a semi-conscious state and called an ambulance. The doctors were clear. Very severe poisoning, needing sophisticated equipment and round-the-clock care that couldn't be provided at home. Michael experienced deja vu, remembering the past and wondering why he was involved in this story again. The ex-wife, who had left him decades ago, was once again affecting his life. He reproached himself. What nonsense, Michael, still hoping? She's sick. Even after recovery, she'll never be the girl you knew. But he couldn't let Samantha die alone. 
He knew that no amount of treatment was a guarantee, but he couldn't abandon her. Jessica looked at Michael Lawrence, feeling how hard it was for him to even utter those words. You can't decide how to tell her you're her daddy because you're afraid you won't impress her. I think Mary would be happy to know she has a real father who wants to see her and be there for her. I only spent a few days with her, but I sensed how much she needed someone of her own, someone close to her. And you know, the fact that you can be there for her is already more than most people can offer. Jessica sensed how much Michael needed those words, confirmation that he could be a good father to his daughter despite all his past mistakes. Maybe I don't have the right to say this, but I'm scared of losing Mary. She's become someone very close to me, and I don't want her to disappear from my life. Maybe I could see her once in a while, take a walk in the park, go to a cafe, maybe the zoo might understand if you're against it, but uh, she's become a part of my life, Jessica said quietly, feeling how important it was for her not to lose touch with the girl. Michael listened, nodding thoughtfully. Jessica, I can see that my daughter has grown attached to you and I think she'll be only too happy to spend time with you. But first, I want to mend our relationship, show her that I'm her father. After that, I'd love it if you could keep seeing each other. At home, Jessica already had Michael waiting for her, and the atmosphere was tense. We need to talk, he said, frantically pulling on his jacket and trying to appear calm. But Jessica deferred the conversation until she met Mary, who was waiting downstairs for Uncle Michael. You remember Uncle Michael, don't you? You used to visit him when you were little. Your mom used to leave you at his place. Will you go to see him? Jessica asked gently. You want me to go? Am I boring you? Mary looked innocently at Jessica, her face reflecting fear and hope at the same time. No, it's not that baby girl. It's just that your mom is sick, will be in the hospital for a long time. You're going to live with Uncle Michael. That's your real daddy. He really wants to be there for you and take care of you. Jessica tried to explain the situation as gently as possible, trying to hide her pain from the up. Mary stood in front of Jessica, her eyes shining with joy and tenderness. Jessica felt a moment of peace in her heart. This little person seemed to be able to weave all the pieces of her broken heart back together. You mean a lot to me, Mary, Jessica said quietly, and I'm so glad you have a daddy who loves you very much and that we'll be able to see each other. That makes me incredibly happy. Mary's confession that Michael was her daddy was so pure and simple that Jessica's pain instantly dissipated, leaving only a smile on her face. And that's our little secret, Jessica smiled back, kissing Mary on the top of her head. She promised herself that she would keep this little happiness going as best she could for the desire for a better life. The determination to stand up for her happiness. It all made sense when Jessica held Mary's hand, feeling her endless trust and love. And even though the road ahead was not an easy one, in that moment, Jessica knew she could overcome all challenges. She knew that life was full of surprises, but now she had a new purpose, to share those surprises with the people she loved, to find moments of joy, even where there seemed to be none. And Mary's laughter was a bright ray of light on her path. Baba Vera was so moved by this story that she even cried. Poppy Parson couldn't hold back her tears either. She could see that the situation with her son was causing her real heartache. Mary looked at the grandmothers talking to each other and thought about whether or not to ask Poppy Parson about what she had mumbled while lying in the bushes. It was awkward to touch the subject. And Grandma Vera, as if she had forgotten what her granddaughter had told her. She didn't ask anything either. Or maybe she really forgot, didn't care. Oh, poor Poppy, sighed Grandma Vera on the way back. She raised her son alone, just like me, stretched, tried, did so much for him and he left her alone, and he lives happily in the city. He's got a wife there, a family, he's forgotten his mother. He doesn't care that she's sick. She's been lying around the house for so long, barely able to walk. Neighbors ran to the store for her, but not her son. What a fate. I guess we're a bit like Poppy, me and her. Why didn't you ask her? I told you about what she was mumbling in the bushes, about Leo's son like he was the one who was trying to ruin her. And anyway, sighed Grandma Vera, looking at her granddaughter. She seems to be a smart girl, but sometimes she just blabs. Do you think she would be pleased to hear that? Especially since Poppy told her how she got into the woods. Her son had nothing to do with it. And the fact that it's him. I think that's what she really thought in her delirium. And there's some truth to what she said. Of course, Leo almost ruined his mother with his indifference, betrayal, oblivion. Good, at least the doctors pulled her out, 
cured her. As they say, there is no good without good. If Poppy had not been in the hospital so slowly and would have died at home alone, and now she's been treated for her heart condition. And now she'll live another 100 years on the new pills. Mary shook her head. Still, something in this story bothered her very much. Baba Vera and Mary visited Poppy a few more times. The old ladies had become very friendly. It was good that things had worked out that way. One day said Poppy, it was worth being lost in the woods to meet good people like you. We'll be friends now, smiled Grandma Vera. We won't get away from each other now. And such a light atmosphere arose around the three of them. Such a trusting atmosphere that Mary finally made up her mind, Baba Poppy, said the girl. As it happened, that was what she had begun to call Poppy. Can I ask you something? Baba Vera looked at her granddaughter warningly, but she decided that she would go through with it. Of course you can, dear Poppy smiled at her. There, in the bushes, when I found you, for some reason you said that your son Leo, that he decided to send you to the other world. I thought he'd done something to you and left you in the woods. What a restless little brat, exclaimed Grandma Vera angrily. Forgive her, her tongue is boneless, and her imagination is irrepressible, always thinking of something. But she's right. Poppy shook her head. Her eyes suddenly became so sad that Mary immediately regretted having asked her question. She had to know the truth, though. After all, if Leo was really guilty of something, then Poppy was still in danger, and Mary cared about her fate. The girl was worried about her and her grandmother's new acquaintance. What do you mean? She's right. Grandma Vera didn't understand. What are you talking about? It's true, friend, Poppy decided. I'll tell you my story. I'm ashamed, of course, to confess such things. In my delirium, I told the truth. Leo, my only son, really wanted to send me to the afterlife. It's a hard thing to realize. I didn't fully believe it, but everything says it's true. It's unfortunate. Poppy raised her son alone. In that, she was a lot like Grandma Vera. But the reasons why the women's sons were left fatherless were different. Baba Vera's husband died of a heart attack. But with Poppy's husband, Andrew, it was a different story. Young Poppy met her future husband by chance at the harvest. They sent them then in the village help young people from the city. Among them, and Andrew was cheerful, humorous, the soul of the company. He amused the whole brigade with his jokes. He didn't work too fast himself. It's understandable a city dweller not used to the land. But he cheered everyone up. Andrew was everyone's favorite at first. He was funny, a good-natured joker. And a good-looking one, too. Bright blue eyes, hair the color of ripe wheat. A wide, open smile. Poppy was being courted by a former classmate of hers, Jerry. He was a nice guy, quiet and thorough. And she seemed to like him in every way. You couldn't go wrong with a guy like that. With such a family, life will be nourished and measured, right? But against Andrew's background, Jerry suddenly seemed to Poppy somehow small, simple. With the arrival of a cheerful city boy in the village, Poppy's eyes were fixed only on him. And not just her eyes. To the great annoyance of young Poppy, there were girls around Andrew both local and visiting, making eyes at him, trying to talk to the handsome guy. He didn't say no to anyone. He tried to pay attention to everyone. This caused unpleasant feelings in Poppy's soul. Something like jealousy. The girl self-corrected for incomprehensible feelings. Well, what does she expect at all? He is not for her a bird, not her flight. He is so handsome, so modern, so fashionable as if a guy from the movies. And she's a country shepherdess who gets lost in his presence. No eyebrows as black as felt boots, no statuesque figure, no mop of hair down to her waist, nothing to look at. Why would Andrew want her when he could have anyone? But Andrew chose her. It came as a complete surprise to Poppy. At that moment, the guy approached her at the disco, which was organized in the local club on the occasion of the end of the harvest. Andrew invited Poppy to dance and said words that made the girl dizzy. She had never heard such exquisite compliments, especially to herself. Andrew knew how to choose beautiful words and his gaze directed at Poppy reflected sincere admiration. Much later, Poppy realized why Andrew had taken notice of her. He was a charming catcher with charisma, who had nothing to do in the city he did not want to work, but needed a roof over his head. Rumors of orphan Poppy, living alone and in need of support, reached Andrew the perfect chance for him. 
to settle in the village and win the heart of a naive girl, he was not difficult. So they began to live together the city's handsome man and Poppy, who was in love with him. The wedding was held modestly in the spring. The young people had no money for a party. Poppy worked as a librarian for a small salary, and Andrew worked at odd jobs. Although trained as a painter, he allegedly could not get a job in his specialty. If he could earn money, he spent it on entertainment, pulling his friends into his feasts. Jerry, Poppy's former lover, had a hard time with their separation, but Poppy's heart belonged to Andrew from the day he appeared in the village. Andrew was never able to get used to life in the village house. Andrew had spent his whole life in the city, and therefore the usual village chores were difficult for him no wood to chop, no fire to light in the stove. He wasn't used to hard work. Poppy had to show and tell him everything. Unprepared was the discovery that the house requires constant attention and repair, and to take care of the site must be regular. In winter, the snow is cleared every day, and water from the well for hundreds of meters to carry is not easy. All this depressed Andrew life in the countryside seemed different to him. As soon as I get a proper job in the city, we'll move. He kept telling Poppy. Deep down, he liked the countryside fresh air, kind people, but life seemed too hard. Poppy supported him. She was ready to follow Andrew anywhere, even to the city, even to the end of the world. But time passed, and he never found a steady job, while Poppy's salary remained a stable source of income. People in the village began to whisper Poppy's young husband was living a life of leisure, sitting on her neck, never lifting a finger in the house. I wish you'd married Jerry, Poppy. Complained the neighbor. He's a reliable fellow, he still loves her. But what about him? Riding around on your back, having fun with his buddies. Indeed, Andrew often gathered with local guys, organized feasts, went for a drive, sometimes with girls. There were rumors around the village about his infidelity, but Poppy didn't want to hear any of it. She ignored the talk, though deep down she was afraid for Andrew and possible trouble on the roads. Poppy hoped that having a baby would change family life. Fatherhood usually made men more responsible and mature. She still genuinely loved Andrew for his charm, his blue eyes and his optimistic attitude. Next to him the world seemed brighter and fuller, without him life seemed dull and gray. But Andrew's actions still offended her. Attempts to talk seriously usually ended in jokes, and Poppy forgot her worries again under his influence. When Poppy became pregnant, Andrew's reaction was not a happy one. He even suggested terminating the pregnancy, arguing that it was because they were young and their lives were unsettled. But Poppy insisted, feeling they would have a son. Andrew eventually supported his wife's decision and began to actively look for work, but without results. Still, Poppy was happy to see his efforts. The birth of their son Leo changed everything for Poppy. Her world now revolved around her son, evoking much stronger feelings than those she had had for her husband. Her view of Andrew had also changed the woman now saw all the faults she had previously turned a blind eye to. His indifference to housework and lack of attention to his son were now conspicuous. Andrew put almost no effort into caring for the newborn. The entire family was now struggling to make ends meet, living on minimal payments from the government. It seemed that Andrew didn't even seek to make a difference. There had long been an opportunity to learn how to at least repair something around the house or chop wood, but he had not shown the slightest desire. With the arrival of the baby and Poppy's fascination with motherhood, Andrew tended to avoid the house, spending time with friends. He returned home late, often in a state of alcoholic intoxication, and did not get out of bed until dinner. He to his wife's reproaches, Andrew now responded with harshness and even insults. Why do you think I don't want to go home? because I hate to look at you. He'd say, which was particularly depressing to Poppy, pulling on the whole household, especially in the absence of money, was unbearably hard for Poppy. She was grateful for the help of neighbors one of them could take care of the child while Poppy went out on business. Someone brought groceries. Even old baby clothes from neighborhood kids helped save money. While the local community supported Poppy, Andrew continued to cheat, promising to earn money in town but returning without it. Rumors reached Poppy about his entertaining in town with friends and young girls. Now she agreed with the opinion of the neighbors about her husband he behaved unworthily, proved to be lazy and deceitful. Instead of giving the money he earned to his family, Andrew spent it on pleasure. Who do you listen to? Andrew resented Poppy when she questioned him. Your husband or the gossips? 
Those in town cheated again, gave less than they promised. Yeah, I went to a pub with a friend, had a little drink. There must be some joy in life. When Leo grew up, she decided to divorce because it was unbearable to live like that. Now, working and handling money made it easier. She realized that she could support a child on her own, but to support her son and her constantly unemployed husband, who likes to party, was much more difficult. Ever since Andrew had gone from an attractive blue-eyed guy to a local alcoholic, his charisma and charm had vanished as if they had never existed. The cloudy eyes, the unhealthy complexion, the gaunt look. Andrew was now taking money from his wife's purse, her paycheck he needed for drinks. He wasn't shy about getting funds that way. At first she could not even believe it, looking for other reasons maybe one of the children at school took it, maybe she herself put somewhere. But soon the woman realized that it was Andrew who was doing it. That realization was the last straw. For the first time in her life, Poppy gave her husband a real scandal. She expressed everything she thought about him in every possible way. At first he was shocked, and then he almost lashed out at her. Poppy thought that now, after such humiliation, Andrew would attack her. But her husband held back. He just swung. Get out of my house and out of my life. Poppy said firmly, surprised at the determination in her voice. We're getting a divorce. I don't want a husband like that. And our son shouldn't have to see that kind of example every day. Yes, Poppy did it for her son's sake first and foremost. Leo deserved to live in a calm and normal environment. A father who constantly spent his time partying and drinking was definitely not what he needed. It's best for everyone, they decided. Andrew, at first frightened, tried to convince Poppy not to make a rash move. For a while he even changed, he stopped drinking and found himself a more or less stable part-time job. However, his determination did not last long. Soon he returned to his old way of life. Poppy, seeing no other way out, divorced him and kicked him out of the house. Where he would go and where he would live now, she no longer cared. The main thing was to keep Andrew away from her and their child. Poppy was calmer and easier without him. It was a paradox. Andrew left and a new phase began in Poppy's life with her son. Life didn't get easier, but at least it became calmer and more orderly. Left alone with her son, it was as if Poppy had found freedom. Leo was still very young and did not have time to get attached to his father, who often disappeared from home or spent time on his adventures. Poppy worked hard after working in the library. She washed the floors at school to bring home an extra penny. Leo did not need anything. There were clothes and delicious food and toys, although for this had to work very hard. The boy grew up on his own, like many village children, and at first Poppy thought that in time she would find it easier. But the burden of housework remained on her shoulders. Leo did not help around the house, finding a lot of excuses, from a lot of lessons to a pain in the head. At the same time, he always had time to go out with friends and ride his bike. Poppy was lenient about it, thinking it was important for a child to have a happy childhood and didn't want to hurt her son by not being able to create a complete family for him. Is it really worth depriving Leo of these happy moments of childhood? Let him enjoy it. And when he grows up, he'll realize everything himself, Poppy thought. But as Leo grew up, the situation in the family did not get easier. The boy did not want to help around the house and his interest in his studies was very superficial. He passed from class to class almost out of respect for his mother, who worked at the same school as a librarian. Poppy asked the teachers and talked to the headmaster it would have been too shameful for Leo to stay on for a second year. The village treated the hard-working woman with warmth and understanding, but as the neighbor and predicted, everything was going to the end of their story will be sad. Already at school, Leo began to be fond of drinking began to communicate with not very good company of older guys. Poppy tried to keep those guys away from Leo, even threatened them with the police, but they only laughed at her concern. The situation escalated when Leo was taken to the police for attempted shoplifting. He was released thanks to the local community's understanding of Poppy's situation, who was bearing the brunt of raising her son alone. The older Leo got, the clearer Poppy realized that he was following in his father's footsteps. She even saw it as a kind of punishment for having once kicked Andrew out, who soon finally rolled over and died. Poppy couldn't help but feel guilty about her ex-husband's fate and the fact that she seemed unable to stop the sad cycle of fate in her family. The woman's heart was breaking with pain and despair. Anna tried to talk to Leo to convey to him the simple truths of life, hoping that she could still change his path. 
Her mother's words didn't seem to reach Leo, as his blank and indifferent stare testified. Perhaps Poppy should have started acting sooner, but the hustle and bustle of providing a family with a life distracted her, and she hadn't realized it at the time. She believed that the example of parents was the most important thing in education. But she hadn't considered the influence of heredity, which now had such a profound effect on Leo. He began to follow his father's path, taking money from Poppy's bag, coming home drunk, putting everything on his mother's shoulders, living for his own pleasures. After school, he didn't go on to further education, probably because of his poor grades. Poppy tried to get him a job on the farm, but he ran away after a few days. What are you trying to do, make a slave out of me? I'll be busting my back out there. He complained to his mother and accused her of depriving him of his parental support by kicking his father out. Leo's words hit Poppy where it hurt the most that maybe she could have done something differently and prevented this outcome. In an instant, she felt very dizzy and realized that it was pointless to argue with her son. When Leo left for the city, Poppy was disturbed but didn't bother him, hoping that perhaps there was something different waiting for him there that wasn't in the village. The years passed and Leo was rarely in the village, sometimes calling his mother and telling her that he was doing well, that he had got a job in a factory, had qualified and was renting an apartment. Poppy, listening to his stories, despite all his past troubles, felt a restrained joy for her son. There was still a note of hope in her heart that Leo's life would turn out better than his father's. If that was indeed the case, Poppy could finally relax. Leo seemed to have found himself. However, Poppy couldn't fully believe him. Their family history was full of deception. But the reasoning that Leo was living somewhere and earning something was hopeful. Unfortunately, Leo chose the wrong path. He ended up in jail, but thanks to the fact that he was caught the first time, he was not in jail for long. In prison, his mother visited him, sympathizing with him. After being released early, Leo returned home serious and slimmed down. But the temporary return to the village did not detain him, and he went to the city again. Before leaving, he assured his mother that he could start a new life. I've learned from my mistakes, become wiser, he said. And it seemed he had indeed changed. In the city, Leo married Margot, a nurse with a difficult fate. Leo introduced Margot to his mother as a respectful, pleasant and kind woman who had been through some difficult trials in her life, including the loss of her son, Poppy. Seeing how Margot genuinely loved Leo, finally accepted her. She began to hope that after all the hardships and mistakes, her son would have a good life after all. Over the years, life settled down. Leo and Margot settled in the city and rarely visited Poppy which was understandable because they were so busy. The most important thing for Poppy was to know that her son and his family were doing well. Margot and Leo had a daughter, Emily. The baby girl was incredibly sweet. Poppy was immensely happy for them. Margot had found the joy of motherhood again, and Leo, having become a father, had no doubt changed for the better, especially having such a beautiful daughter. Poppy, however, saw her granddaughter rarely. Each visit was a holiday for her. Her love for her granddaughter filled her heart. As she grew older, Poppy asked her son more and more often to bring Emily on vacation, assuring her that she would have fun in the countryside. It's so nice here in the summer, it's a great place to be, she said. But the son waved off the suggestions and Margot admitted that she was afraid to let her daughter go after losing her son. Poppy understood that. The terrible events had left a deep mark on Margot's soul and her fear of losing loved ones was understandable. As time went on, Poppy felt the loneliness. Especially when her health began to fail, she could no longer even walk to the well without resting. The local boys helped her, for which she was grateful. Poppy's spirits were kept high by the thought that her family was doing well. It seemed a miracle to her that Leo had finally found happiness in family life and stability. She was happy for him although she was sad that he was making less frequent appearances in the village. It had been like this for several years. Occasionally, Leo would call to tell her about his health and share news. His granddaughter, Emily, had graduated from high school and entered law school. Margot, smart and beautiful, works, but suffers from blood pressure, so she has no time to travel. Her son works in a factory. Oh, well, that's all right. The main thing is that he's getting his head on straight. The fact that he's inattentive and insensitive is just the way he is, 
and he's loved just as much for it. Poppy's heart condition worsened. She sighed as she watched a neighbor who had come to visit. Her health had given up completely. The local doctors could only throw up their hands and send her to the city for tests. There was no equipment here. She asked for help from her son, and although he did not refuse, but all postponed then work, then the enrollment of her daughter, or himself, did not feel well. Poppy's health was deteriorating, and she could hardly move around the house. Neighbors helped by bringing food from the store. She was grateful. I thought my days were numbered. Nobody's immortal. She was getting on in years. She marveled at every morning, feeling the joy of a new day. One day Leo arrived unexpectedly, all in a dark frame of mind. Is there anything to eat? He asked at once on the doorstep. Poppy shook her head with difficulty. No, Leo, I'm not getting up at all. There's something left in the fridge, bread and sausage. Make yourself some sandwiches. Leo sighed heavily and went to the kitchen to boil the kettle and make sandwiches, forgetting about his mother's suggestion. He had always been like that, preoccupied only with himself. Such a character was influenced neither by upbringing nor scolding in childhood. I left Margot, the son finally said. Poppy's heart clenched with pain. She was sure Leo had settled into the best possible life. What to do now? Why? She cheated on me, the traitor and she made me work like a galley before that. She didn't see me as a human being. She said I had to succeed in my career, take care of my daughter, work at home. Without all that, she didn't need me. But son, that's just life. The man is the head of the family, his support and protection. Tried to comfort Poppy. Here we go. Do you think it's nice to know you're being used? We've built a life together and now what? I'm allowed to ignore me and find someone wealthier. My daughter's turned against me, too. Emily doesn't even want to see me anymore. Why is that? Because I reacted when I found out about her lover. You hit her. Poppy couldn't believe it. Well, not exactly. Just pushed and slapped her. I had a temper. Leo explained. Poppy could understand him. Margaret seemed to be behaving like Leo's father drinking, partying, not working enough, not participating in household chores, expecting her husband to take care of her thinking it was the norm. Margot couldn't stand it and kicked the slacker out of her apartment. And apparently she got a decent man. You had a family? Did you ruin your own happiness? Poppy sighed. She cheated on me. She ruined the family, not me, replied the son. Poppy only sighed heavily. What are you going to do now? She asked. I guess I'm going to live here for a while. Shrugged his shoulders. When you're not well, I'll help you get better, and then we'll see. Are you sick? I'm very sick. Agreed, Poppy. Not long I have left. The medicine does not help much. You need to go to the city for examination. And then Leonid's face suddenly brightened. Anna noticed this moment, when something clicked in his head. Only then she could not even imagine to what conclusion Leo had reached. I'm taking you to the city, Leo said. We have to make arrangements with the doctor. Find a car. Margot borrowed my car in the divorce. Maybe she'll lend it to me for such an occasion. There was a spark of hope in Poppy's heart. Maybe her son really could help. He was worried and was already making plans to get his mother into hospital. She was pleased by her son's concern. The attention of grown-up children really is priceless. A few days passed. Leo disappeared in the city from morning till evening coming home late at night and telling her that he was solving her problems. She had waited and hoped so much. Her condition began to worsen, though she didn't stop taking the medications prescribed by the local doctors. But afterward, she began to suspect. Leo, suddenly caring, was giving her pills. The size and taste of the medicine had changed the woman noticed it, but didn't pay much attention to it, as well as to the fact of finding the vitamin pack in the trash. Only later in the woods, Poppy realized instead of vital drugs her son gave her harmless vitamins. That's why she was feeling worse and worse. Leo must have thought she was fading too slowly. One afternoon, a car pulled up to the gate and Leo got out. It must have been Margot's after all. We're going into town. Leo said as he came into the house. I found the car, they're waiting at the hospital. The timing was good, Poppy was barely out of bed, weakening by the hour. Leo helped her pack and carried her mother in his arms to the car, 
constantly looking around. Only later did she realize why he did so at that moment almost everyone was busy, and no one should have noticed that he was taking his mother out of the village. The journey had begun. Poppy looked out the window curiously, enlivened by the sight she hadn't seen in so long. Her heart sang with joy, for her son was beside her and everything was going according to plan. Suddenly Leo turned off the highway onto a country road, stopped the car and helped her out. He set her down on the soft grass and said, what are you doing? She asked. Sit a little, get some fresh air, and I'm here near. I need to go to the bushes, replied the son. But Leo did not go in the direction of the bushes and returned to the car and started the engine. Poppy, dumbfounded, asked Leo what's going on. Only now did she realize everything she had not noticed before. Leo said, you're going to die soon anyway, but my house will be. I'm in debt, I'm being threatened, I'm just hastening the inevitable. What on earth are you doing? Poppy gasped, gripped by fear not for herself, but for her son. Don't worry, I won't get caught, Leo said confidently. The neighbors already know you're better. They'll think you went for a walk and got lost. No one will know anything. Leo, how will you live after all this? Think about it. She tried to dissuade him. I'll live. And you don't care anymore. He cut her off abruptly. Poppy stared after the car, not believing that her son had really left. She called out to him, begged him to stay, but in vain. Alone in the middle of the clearing, she cried with helplessness and loss. But soon she shook herself, found her footing and set off, following the sound of the motor. But she made a mistake and collapsed from exhaustion. It seemed her son's plan was on the verge of fulfillment. But then she was found. As she finished her story, Poppy looked at her amazed listeners with tears in her eyes. You know everything now. Wow. Exhaled the girl. Baba Vera hugged Poppy tightly and asked, and where is your Leo now? They were looking for him, determined my identity. Tried to find my son. He is my only relative. But they couldn't. He disappeared. Even put out a bolo. I don't know what happened to him. Maybe those to whom he owed something did something to him. Or he disappeared of his own free will, afraid that I would file a complaint against him. Now my heart towards my son is indifferent. It was New Year's Eve morning. Poppy's house smelled like a holiday pine tar, fresh baked goods, tangerines. Grandma Vera was cooking skillfully in the kitchen. Mary was getting ready for school, admiring herself in the mirror. Today was the last school day before the long-awaited vacation. Baba Vera and Mary were now living with Poppy. It was working out naturally after all that had happened. Granny and her granddaughter had nowhere to go and Poppy was having a hard time on her own. At the hospital, Poppy was examined and given appointments that made her noticeably better. She suspected that her recovery was not only due to the treatment, but also to the presence of people close to her. After all, to be needed by someone is happiness. Poppy regarded Vera as a friend and younger sister, and Mary as a granddaughter. They lived peacefully and amicably, each with their own difficult histories, but together they felt stronger. Poppy and Vera often discussed life, marveling at the strange way fate can change strangers become close and family become strangers. Mary stood by the side of the highway and shivered. October was getting colder. She should get a warmer jacket from the pantry. Grandma Veronica had warned her granddaughter yesterday, don't be lazy, prepare tomorrow's clothes, according to the weather. But Mary had no time she finished her homework, then watched a TV series, then with her friends in the yard on the bench chatted until late in the evening. And then it's time to go to bed. Nothing, tomorrow is Saturday. She will have time to find a warm jacket and clean it, if necessary. The girl didn't like that down jacket. She'd inherited it from her neighbor's daughter, Kristen. She was a grown woman, studying in the city, at university. And the jacket Kristen had worn when she was Mary's age was in good condition, of course, but not fashionable at all. But there was no choice here. Grandma Veronica didn't have that much money to buy her granddaughter fancy new clothes every season. Mary understood this very well, that's why she was never capricious, unlike most of her classmates. Her grandmother tried very hard to make sure that their small family did not need anything. And Mary also tried because she was not a little girl 12 years old, after all. And now, after school, Mary was selling dairy products on the road leading to the city. There was a private farm in the village called Sullivan's. They had goats and cows. They had a whole farmyard full of animals. 
They took most of their produce to the city, to the market. But there was always a surplus cottage cheese, milk, sour cream. That's what Mary sold after school for Uncle Sullivan. He even built a special counter and a cart himself. He's got good hands, of course. Mary used that cart every day after school to take the milk to the road. An hour or two and it was sold like hotcakes. Mary had her own regular customers here. Then Mary would return the empty cart to the Sullivans and give them the proceeds. And when they paid her in money, they paid her a percentage of the proceeds when they paid her in natural products. Aunt Tammy also took the young worker out to lunch every time. She almost always refused. She was uncomfortable. Even though the neighbor sincerely wanted to treat the girl. Grandmother Veronica received a tiny pension and worked part-time as a cleaner at the local clinic. Every morning and every evening she went to the other end of the village to the old two-story building and washed the floors. In the afternoon she did the housework cleaning, cooking. Mary helped her, of course. But Grandma Veronica usually sent her granddaughter to her room to do her homework. Go, go better to your math, you'll have time to wave a rag. You'll work hard in life. Right now you're focused on your studies. Mary knew that it was very important for Grandma Veronica that her granddaughter did well in school, made friends with children from decent families and got an education. The grandmother was very afraid that the girl would repeat the fate of her parents. She loved Mary and dreamed of a better future for her. And not just dreamed, but did a lot for this. For example, bought Mary books. The girl learned to read early and by the time she was eight or nine years old, she had read all the children's books from the meager local library. And then Grandmother Veronica began to buy Mary books in the city on her small pension. Read, read, my clever girl. You'll learn, you'll get into people, you'll become a respected and important person. And Grandma Veronica often talked to Mary's teachers about the girl's academic performance. She kept a close eye on it, but here everything was just fine. The girl was one of the best students in the class. And no wonder, because Grandmother Veronica so much engaged with her granddaughter before school and letters she taught her to write, and numbers to add up. And in general, a lot of interesting and important things about the world told. Mary grew up with her grandmother, who was not even her relative according to the documents. In the village where everyone knew each other, there were no problems with this. Mary's story was common knowledge. Grandma Veronica's son Stephen was a tomboy from childhood. He didn't like to study, nor did he want to. He didn't listen to his mother, and he had no father. Grandma Veronica's husband died when the son was only two years old. A heart attack. Unexpected, like a thunderbolt. So the young woman was left a widow with a small child in her arms. She had to carry everything on herself, the house, her son, and her work. Baba Veronica worked as a milkmaid in several shifts at once. How else to feed herself and the child? Stephen grew on his own, like a weed. The woman realized that she should pay more attention to her son, but there was no opportunity. By the time you come back from the evening milking, it's late. And then there's cooking, laundry, and homework to check. Stephen, I must say, has always been a sociable guy. His friends came first. He liked to go out, play with kids, spend time outside the house. At first, his mother was pleased with the easy character of her son. Well, yes, not an angel, of course, but he is a guy. That's normal. But he's so nice to talk to. He's got friends in half the village. When he grows up, he'll be a support for his mother. He'll slowly take over the men's work. But time passed. Stephen grew up. But he wasn't going to help his parents. He still had on his mind only partying with friends, the same knuckleheads like himself. At school, the boy began to skip school, lessons completely abandoned. Once the teachers even wanted to leave the guy for a second year. The mother intervened, begging to give her son a chance to correct. It's such a shame. Two years in the same class. Veronica begged her son for help. Then she even demanded that he take over the household chores. It was hard for her to carry everything alone. But he always found excuses or just let his mother's words pass his ears. He was tempted by the will partying freedom. He came home only late in the evening to sleep and eat. Veronica was in despair. She realized that her son was getting out of hand, but there was nothing she could do about it. What can you do side her friends, to whom the woman complained about her situation? The boy grows up without a father's strictness, without a male example. You, Veronica, have no father, no brother, no one to keep Stephen in check. Well, the army will fix him. 
After the army, everyone's brains get back in place. Veronica hoped the army would be a miracle. And indeed, home after the service came a completely different Stephen matured, serious and full of life plans. I decided to go to the city, to the construction college, he announced his decision to his mother. Veronica rejoiced. Previously, her offspring did not talk about the future at all, living one day at a time. Now he was thinking about studying. I'll need money for the first time, he added, until I find a job. They give me a dormitory, but I need something to travel on, something to eat. Of course, of course. Veronica splashed her hands. What are we talking about? The woman had some savings. Stephen knew about them. Veronica was saving from her paycheck for a rainy day. You never know. Well, if that was the case, if Stephen decided to study to get on his feet, no money could be spared for that. Veronica was flying on wings back then. Well, look at that. A son getting smart. Stephen got into school and happily informed his mother about it over the phone. He started living on his own in the city. Every month he faithfully showed up for money and told his parents how well he was doing now his studies were going well, and he liked it, and the guys were good. Sometimes, however, he asked for a bigger sum he needed to buy textbooks or repair something in the dormitory. Veronica gave everything, not regretting anything. Then she saved money, sat on bread and water for weeks before the paycheck, just so that her son would be well. After a while, Veronica began to notice that after Stephen's arrival, things disappeared from the house, her only gold earrings, almost new electric kettle, grandmother's ring. Veronica at first blamed it on the neighbors, then thought that she herself put these items somewhere and forgot about them. But then everything fell into place. Veronica began to hear rumors. The child of one of the neighbors entered her son's construction technical school, and it turned out right away that Stephen didn't go there. You go check everything yourself, advised Veronica this neighbor. Maybe your son was expelled, but expelled for truancy or failing grades. And he keeps telling you fairy tales. What? A student. So Veronica went. At first she thought she'd give up, because the story she'd painted seemed too unrealistic. Stephen couldn't lie to her, looking her straight in the eye. But doubts crept into the woman's head. So she went. At the dean's office, the truth came out. Turns out Stephen wasn't expelled. It turns out he never even went to this technical school. I mean, he'd been lying to his mom from the beginning. That's probably when the woman realized that all her efforts were for nothing. Her son would never turn out to be a good man. Stephen's a liar, a lazy man. Of course, he's the one who made things disappear from the house. He needs the money. Veronica cried all night that night. Resentment, bitterness, disappointment, it all came down on her like a heavy burden. How many plans, how many hopes were connected with her son? And now what? Was it all for nothing? And hard work, and sleepless nights, and excitement, and anxiety for the child? Or maybe it was her own fault for what had happened to Stephen? Of course she did. After all, in an attempt to earn a penny, Veronica did not pay attention to her son at all, did not check his homework, did not inquire about what was happening in his life. Tiredness, endless fatigue and lack of time, and no one around who could help with the upbringing of the boy. That's the result. And yet Veronica then managed to convince herself that everything could still be fine. She decided to have a serious conversation with Stephen. The woman determined for herself a line of behavior. She will not blame her son, will not call him a liar. Veronica would simply talk to him seriously and thoroughly. For the first time in a while, it wasn't an easy conversation. Stephen arrived, as usual, to pick up another load of money. He had a carefree smile on his face, but now Veronica saw what his son's eyes were like insincere, prickly in some way. There was dislike or contempt in them. I know everything, son, Veronica looked at her son. About the technical school. Are you in trouble? Tell it like it is. At first, Stephen tried to deny it, but Veronica explained that she had already gone to the dean's office and found out everything. All right, Stephen bowed his head. Yes, Mom, you're right. I'm in trouble. It turned out that Stephen was not going to enter the technical school. He realized that he couldn't afford to study, and of course he would fail the entrance exams. He hadn't studied well at school, and miracles don't happen. He wanted to get a job in the city, where you can find sources of income even without education. So he found one, got mixed up with a bad crowd. 
Guys were burglarizing dacha plots. They took appliances, furniture, clothes, dishes, anything they could sell, and then sell it at the flea market. When Veronica heard about it, she clutched her heart, son, how could it be like this? Did I teach you that? It just happened Stephen lowered his head below his shoulders. He looked so lost, so remorseful that Veronica felt very sorry for him. Money was needed. There were no other ways to earn it. And so, Stephen said he wanted to leave the gang, wanted to return to an honest life, but they wouldn't let him go. It's these people, Mom, they're threatening me, demanding a ransom for me to leave, a payoff. Otherwise, I'm finished. Why don't we go to the police? Veronica suggested. What she heard gave her the chills. How could it be? Stephen had always been a lazy bum, a slacker. But to do something like this. What police? Have you forgotten? I'm just like them? I'll go straight to jail. I don't want to. So what now? There's no way out. Why not? There is. I have to give them the money, like a ransom for me, and then they'll let me go. How much? And Stephen said a sum that made Veronica's eyes water. You see, Mom? It's almost impossible to get out. And I'm so eager to start a new life. Fate has already taught me a lesson. I'm different now. I want to live an honest life. I'll think about what I can do, Veronica nodded. And she thought, thought for a long time, carefully weighed all the pros and cons. She went through different options. The woman was not given a loan for such an amount. Salary is small, age is already pre-retirement. So she had to sell the house because Veronica had nothing else. Mom, how did you do it? Rejoiced Stephen, who showed up at his mother's house the following week. Veronica told him everything as it happened. Where will you live now? The boy got excited. I'm already renting a room at Emily's. She's moving to Hope with her son anyway. And I don't think anyone's going to buy it. You know the state of that house. So I rented it from her for next to nothing. I can afford it. Thank you. Stephen exhaled. I'll never forget that. I'll buy you a new house. I'll buy you a new house. And not in this neck of the woods, but in the city. We're going to have a life. Stephen disappeared with the money. Veronica realized that it was unlikely that her son's promise would come true, but she had no regrets. She didn't want anything. Only if her son got rid of his bad company and started a new life. That would be her greatest reward. Emily's house, where Veronica now lived, was a tiny wooden hut. One room, a small kitchen, outdoor facilities, creaky floors, shaky roof. But the stove was functioning properly. That's a big deal. Gradually, Veronica settled down in the house, made it cozy, hung new curtains, laid fresh tablecloths, threw out unnecessary junk. With the landlady's permission, of course, Stephen came rarely. Veronica didn't expect Stephen to pay her back. Most of the time, he came to borrow money from his mother for living expenses. He seemed to be doing well in the city. He said he worked at a construction site, rented an apartment, and worked from morning till night. The salary was good, but sometimes it was delayed. In those cases, he'd come to his mother's house to scrape together some money. Stephen's life was clearly not easy. He looked thin, pale, eyes dark, troubled. They keep going back and forth. Did the mother believe what her son said about working in the city? Yes and no. He'd been deceived many times before. But on the other hand, Veronica really wanted it to be as Stephen said. It gave her peace of mind. Veronica herself continued to work, but she couldn't pull several shifts as before. Age, health was failing her. The labor of a milkmaid is not easy. She had enough to live on, and that was all right. Of course, it was worrying that old age was coming, and Veronica had no corner of her own. What if Emily's kids decided to sell the house? What then? Where would she go? Veronica couldn't afford to rent a decent place. It was a drag, but the woman decided to accept her fate as it was. She couldn't change anything. Her friends criticized her for selling the house and giving all the money to Stephen. She'd drunk it, skipped town, and now she was homeless. Veronica just shook her head. She'd look at her friends and neighbors if their children came to them with such a request. They'd probably sell everything too just to save the child. 
Veronica didn't regret what she'd done. Stephen was disliked in the village, and therefore probably there were different rumors about him. Veronica realized that it could very well be true. Still, she preferred not to believe what people said. They said that Stephen was using different substances. They said he was sometimes seen in bad company. Veronica realized that Stephen now appeared very rarely. When he did show up, he really didn't look his best. But his son said he worked hard and slept little, and that was why he was so thin. And Veronica wanted to grasp these versions of his story like a drowning man grasping at straws. People lie. All they want to do is scratch their tongues. One day near evening, Stephen knocked on the kitchen window. It was late fall, windy, cold, raining. As usual, the sun showed up unannounced. But this time the boy wasn't alone. He was holding the hand of a woman thin, with a short haircut, a predatory look and a smirk on her lips. There was something repulsive about her. But Veronica, of course, did not show her attitude toward the strange visitor. This is Gabriel Stephen introduced his companion, my girlfriend. Veronica smiled at Gabrielle, thinking to herself that she wasn't a girl at all. The lady looked to be in her mid-forties. Her figure was almost girlish thin and there were deep wrinkles under her eyes and around her mouth. It was obvious that she drank and smoked, not the kind of bride Veronica had dreamed of for her son. So what now? As it turns out, everything in life doesn't go according to plan. The main thing was that they were happy together. Veronica invited the guests to the table. She had a pie cooking in the oven. The woman was going to invite her friends to tea. But since it's like this, we're going to live here now with you, Stephen announced. Veronica almost choked on her pie. Well, that's news. It turned out that the couple had rented an apartment in the city, but Stephen had lost his job and Gabrielle didn't work at all. She was laid off a long time ago and now they don't hire her anywhere because soon the woman will go on maternity leave. Who would want a woman like that? You see, Mom, it's a desperate situation, Stephen ranted. We've got a baby on the way, and we've got nowhere to live, no money. You can't kick us out. No, of course not, Veronica shook her head. It was a thought she had yet to get used to. Veronica had lived alone in the small house for so long, and the loneliness didn't weigh her down yet. There wasn't enough room for so many people. On the other hand, where would they go? These adults who had never settled down, especially if they had a baby on the way. And Veronica started a whole new life. She didn't particularly like it, but what could she do? A son is a son. She raised him herself. Stephen didn't even think about getting a job. Neither did Gabriel. Both of them sat quietly on the neck of the elderly Veronica, as if it was the right thing to do. The woman rightly hoped at least to help with the household chores, but it was no use. Gabriel and Stephen quickly found friends in the village the same pro-lifers as themselves. And so it began partying until morning at their new friend's house, then sleeping until dinner, watching TV, and then all over again. Gabrielle was at ease and relaxed with Veronica. She was not at all embarrassed that she lived in someone else's house and at someone else's expense. This simple manner of communication even somewhat impressed Veronica. Holy simplicity, that's what they called it. Gabrielle had a complicated fate. She grew up in an orphanage, did not know her family. From an apartment from the state, she, then a very young graduate, was cheated. Veronica decided she could re-educate Gabrielle, and Stephen's brains would surely fall into place after the baby was born. Except it didn't work out. Mary was born prematurely. Not surprising, given her mother's lifestyle. At first, they didn't want Gabrielle to have the baby at all. The woman was taken by ambulance from the front porch of a convenience store already drugged. But Veronica turned to a neighbor. His son was on the police force, and the little girl was still given to irresponsible parents. Under the control and responsibility of a vigilant grandmother, Veronica hoped that the baby's arrival would change things, but it didn't. Gabrielle had no intention of taking care of her newborn daughter. Immediately after the maternity ward, she plunged into her old life with Stephen. Veronica had struggled to get the grief-stricken parents to draw up the paperwork for Mary. She completely took care of the child, but something responsible grandmother to do still could not for the registration of documents, attachment to the polyclinic, to solve many other issues needed the official representatives of the girl, that is, the parents. 
or rather the mother, because the relationship between Gabriel and Stephen was not formalized, and legally Mary had only her mother. Officially, the grandmother, the only person who cared for the child, was considered a stranger to Mary. It was a bit of a struggle to get the paperwork done, and then Stephen and Gabriel just disappeared one day, leaving the baby in the care of her loving grandmother. To be honest, Veronica breathed a sigh of relief. She had become attached to the little girl from the first days. Of course, it was hard to take care of an infant at such an advanced age. But it's even worse when there are two adults living in the house, leading a dissolute lifestyle. With Stephen and Gabriel gone, things had only gotten better. Veronica was glad that her parents didn't take their daughter with them. The girl simply wouldn't have survived with them. Veronica's heart clenched at the thought of what would happen to the little girl if she suddenly found herself alone with her grief-stricken ancestors. What a cute baby. Admired the neighbors, while a happy Veronica rolled the stroller with sleeping Mary down the driveway. When Stephen was a baby, the woman had no time to take care of him. Now that she was a grandmother, she was going through this phase all over again. Only now she had a little girl charming, fragile, touching, with incredibly long eyelashes and soft curls. Yes, a miracle, agreed Veronica. With those closest to her, she shared her fears, I'm afraid Gabriel will take it away. And yet, why would she need it? Her friends wondered. This is not the kind of person to suddenly arise love for a child. She doesn't need a girl. And the allowance? Do you get an allowance for your granddaughter yourself? No, Gabrielle gets it all on her card. Well, then calm down, she has money, no worries. Veronica knew the neighbors were right. She even tried to do everything according to the law, appealed to the guardianship authorities. But the niece of one of Veronica's fellow villagers worked in the guardianship. She explained the situation to the woman in a friendly manner, you see. The girl will not be given to her parents, of course, but they will not return her to you either. They'll send her to an orphanage. And why? Veronica gasped. I'm her grandmother, according to the documents. You're a stranger to her. And in general, you have no conditions for a child. A rented old house, low income, age. No one will give you the baby. So what do we do? You just live your life as it is. Gabrielle, ask Gabrielle to give you your allowance card in good faith. You're actually raising a child, that's the only way. Only by agreement. But Veronica didn't go to Gabrielle. Of course, no one would give her the card. But the baby. The mother could take the baby. There's no telling. Maybe she'd even get the idea to sell the girl to someone. That's what they do. They'll do anything for money. And so Mary stayed at Veronica's house on a bird's license. Gabriel and Stephen made occasional visits to the village. They came to see their daughter. They smiled at the girl, but shunned her. For her, they were strangers, strange people whom her grandmother was clearly afraid of. Stephen once again borrowed money from his mother, and the sweet couple went away. One day the police knocked on Veronica's door not local, from the city. They said Stephen was dead. The substances he'd been using had taken his health and then his life. Mary was about six years old at the time. Only the need to care for her granddaughter kept Veronica from drowning in black grief. Yes, Stephen's lifestyle was wrong and very dangerous, but his mother hoped, sincerely believed that sooner or later he would take up his mind, become different for the sake of his daughter. Veronica saw that Mary Gabriel wasn't interested at all. Well, that's good. It was better for the little girl to stay with her grandmother than to live with such a mother or in an orphanage. Life went on as usual. Veronica retired and began to work part-time as a cleaner. She practiced a lot with her granddaughter, trying not to make the same mistakes she had made with her son. Mary grew up quite different, not like Stephen attentive, affectionate, hardworking. She tried to help her grandmother in everything, which especially touched Veronica's heart. No one had taken such care of her for a long time. Mary studied well, obeyed her grandmother and everything. And then she found a part-time job selling milk at the Save Lievs on the road. At first, Veronica was worried who knows who drives there on the road frightened the girl or worse. But then she calmed down. Mary was a smart and clever girl, mature beyond her years. She had a good sense of people and knew how to behave with strangers. And the money the girl earned was not at all superfluous. Mary knew her story. Veronica had told her granddaughter about it four years ago. The girl naturally asked questions about her parents. 
Veronica did not consider it necessary to invent beautiful fairy tales. All the same, someone from the village sooner or later will open her eyes to the truth. There was no hiding the truth. It was better to tell Mary about Stephen and Gabrielle herself, choosing her words carefully so as not to traumatize the child. The granddaughter was not particularly upset, because the girl did not know these people before. So what did she have to worry about? True, Mary would certainly be interested to know more about Gabrielle for her mother, her mother, her mother, was still alive. Mary knew that Gabrielle was somewhere in town. Sometimes they even heard from mutual acquaintances Gabrielle had a new boyfriend, or she was in the hospital again. Veronica prayed to God that Gabrielle would live to see Mary come of age. After all, if something happened to her, the guardianship authorities would then be obliged to find her daughter and place the child in an orphanage. In the meantime, so far, so good. Mary never told Baba Vera about it, so as not to upset her. But she often thought about her mother and father. She fantasized about how her fate would have been if they'd been ordinary people. And now, too. A beautiful car was speeding down the highway. Mary could see a family in it, a middle-aged man at the wheel, a woman next to him, probably his wife, and a girl about her age in the back. All three were laughing and talking almost simultaneously. They were probably discussing something pleasant. Mary smiled as she escorted the car with a glance. Happy. I wish she could be like that. It's all right. Grandma's life is not bad either. When Mary grows up, she will buy a nice house in the city, where she and her grandmother will live together. But she'll have to study first, get a good job. A house. This word has recently become somehow alarming because recently something happened that was so afraid of Grandma Vera. The owner of the house where Grandma and Mary lived had died, and her children wished to sell the old house. The buyer for such a wreck will not be found quickly, but they have already advertised. So sooner or later, she and Grandma are going to have to move out. But where to? Grandma Vera is very worried about it. She tries not to show it in front of her granddaughter, but Mary notices not a little girl. Recently, the girl heard a conversation between her grandmother and a neighbor. A. I feel that we will soon go to the world with Mary. Money is not enough to rent a normal room is not enough. I don't know what to do. Beggar Gabrielle and she demands to share her pension. Veronica was very worried about the housing situation. She realized that their modest income would not be enough to rent a normal room. Veronica could not demand money from Gabrielle, fearing that she would take Mary for herself and the girl would end up in terrible conditions or worse in an orphanage. Mary saw how hard it was for her grandmother, and her heart shrank with pity for the only native person. But how could the girl help in such a situation? Probably the only possible support from her not to create unnecessary problems and earn a little at least for bread and milk. Mary had sold off almost all her goods. There was only one and a half liter bottle of milk and a jar of sour cream left. Just a little more and we could go back. That was good because Mary was already freezing in the fresh October wind in her light raincoat. In spite of the cold, Mary sincerely admired the scenery. Behind her was a wide field crossed by a dusty country road. The grass had already withered a little. But not so long ago, the steppe was blooming with bright multicolored flowers. But even now, it is beautiful here. And on the other side of the highway stretches a forest. The bushes and trees are beautiful now. If Mary knew how to draw, she would have put this beauty on paper. What colors gold, purple, bright yellow leaves. All mixed together. The eye is delighted. Suddenly the girl's attention was attracted by something strange, some movement on the other side of the highway. It was as if the bushes on the left side were moving. Mary looked closely. Was it just a vision? No. On the other side of the road, there was a rustle and the bushes moved again. The girl froze. It wasn't that she was frightened, but it sounded like someone big in the bushes. Mary cautiously approached the old woman. She was clearly distraught and mumbled something inaudible to her son. She seemed to be delirious, perhaps because of hypothermia or some disease. The girl squatted down next to the old woman and softly called out to her grandmother, Can you hear me? What happened to you? But the old woman did not react in any way, continuing to mumble and stare somewhere in the void with glazed eyes. Mary realized she couldn't do it alone. She had to call for help. She jumped to her feet and ran back to the road. Her heart was pounding frantically from fear and from running fast. 
When she reached the roadside, Mary stopped, trying to catch her breath and frantically thinking about what to do next. It would take a long time to get to the village, and it would take a long time to find one of the adults. And the old woman needs help right now. Suddenly, she heard the sound of an engine in the distance. A car was coming down the road. Mary waved her arms, trying to get the driver's attention. The car started to slow down. Please help me. There's a grandmother lying in the bushes. She's sick. Mary, who was out of breath, shouted as she ran toward the stopped car. A middle-aged man got out of the car. After listening to the girl's confused story, he nodded and pulled out his cell phone. Okay, I see. Now I'll call an ambulance. And you run to your grandmother. See that it doesn't get worse. I'll be right there. Mary exhaled a sigh of relief, thanked the man and ran back to the old lady. Now at least she wasn't alone in this frightening situation. Help was on the way. Mary shuddered at the old woman's words. It seemed that this grandmother wanted to harm her own son. His name is Leonid. Or maybe it's all a delusion. The old lady's in a terrible state. But what if it's not a delusion? What if this same Leonid right now is watching them from deep in the woods and understands perfectly well that now the girl knows too much? Mary had goosebumps running down her spine. She looked around. It seemed quiet. We must act. The old woman needs help. The girl didn't see any injuries on her body, but there's no telling what her own son had done to her. Maybe he poisoned her? Mary herself cannot help her grandmother. She cannot even lift her. So we must run to the village and call the grown-ups. They'll sort it out for sure. Leaving the tray of unsold goods on the road, Mary ran as fast as she could into the village. She had never run so fast before. The wind whistled in her ears, her hair fluttered behind her back. Soon the girl felt hot. Wasn't it only a short time ago that she was shivering on the road? Already near the village she met her neighbors Uncle Peter and Uncle Stanley. The girl, panting, told them everything. Show me where. Uncle Peter commanded. Mary nodded and ran in another direction. The men followed her. Aunt Angie, Uncle Stanley's wife, heard their dialogue. She immediately rushed into the village. Mary knew that now everyone would know about her terrible discovery. And that's a good thing. The grown-ups would figure out what to do. The responsibility that had weighed heavily on the girl's fragile shoulders seemed to evaporate. The adults were now in charge. On the way, Mary suddenly wondered if she had dreamed it all. The old woman in the bushes, her blue handkerchief, her eyes staring into the distance. But no, the grandmother was still lying in the bushes, only she was no longer talking. Mary was even afraid at first that she was too late for help. She became very frightened. She's alive. Uncle Peter exclaimed, gently lifting the old woman off the ground. How did she get here? Puzzled Uncle Stanley, it doesn't look as if she'd gone mushrooming. There's no basket, and it's not a mushrooming place, said one of the crowd. The other villagers came up. Aunt Angie did her job and got everyone on their feet. Among the crowd, Mary saw Grandma Vera. Seeing a loved one, the girl was relieved. We need an ambulance, exclaimed one of the women. By the time they reach us, so much time will pass, said Grandma Vera. The man will freeze. Peter, take her to our house, or Grandma will catch cold in the wind. We'll wait for the doctors there. I've already called an ambulance, said Uncle Stanley but the police too, just in case. The old woman was brought to the house where Grandma Vera and Mary lived. They laid her on the bed and covered her with a blanket. Mary watched carefully the old woman, who now seemed to be asleep. She waited to see if she would say something again, but the old woman was silent. The women crowded into the room and speculated about the old woman's fate. Maybe she had gone for mushrooms? Lost her way? She wandered and wandered through the woods. But she got on the road, said one. No objected another. That can't be true. Such a thing would definitely be on the news that a man was missing. And here is silence. I think she's not herself. You know, she's out of her mind from old age, so she left. She's a lonely grandmother, so they haven't missed her yet. Mary remembered the words the old woman had said in the heat of forgetfulness. The old woman lamented that her son Leo wanted to get rid of her but in front of the neighbors, the girl did not voice this monologue. First of all, it is not very likely, suddenly seemed to her. The old woman spoke very quietly, barely audible. Secondly, for some reason, Mary did not want this fact to go around the village. 
The local gossips liked to exaggerate and embellish things. No, Mary would tell her grandmother when they were alone. In the meantime. In the meantime. For now, it's best to keep quiet. The police were the first to arrive. They took Mary's statement, asked how the girl came across the old woman. What did she do afterwards? It's good that the uniformed men didn't specify directly whether this grandmother said something or not. Mary couldn't lie to the face of the law, and the locals were eager to catch every word she said so they could pass it on. Then the doctor showed up. Mary breathed a sigh of relief when she saw a white car pull up to their gate. Now she would be helped. They loaded the old woman on a stretcher and carried her to the car. Baba Vera, on realizing this, jumped out after them. From the window, Mary could see her talking to the men in white coats. They're taking her to Springfield, Vera explained when she returned to the house. We should visit her afterward. You don't know what it's like if a person has no one. How does it feel when no one visits you in the hospital? When everyone had gone, Mary told Baba Vera what she'd heard from the old woman. Why didn't you tell the police? Grandmother aghast. I don't know, she shrugged her shoulders. I thought, if the old woman didn't want it, or was she just having some kind of a delusion? That's right, too, agreed Grandma Vera. You're a good girl, you're growing up. You're not a gossip, you don't talk for nothing. You think a hundred times, then you speak. Mary smiled at her grandmother, is she going to be all right? I don't know. I've been trying to ask the doctors, but they've been getting away with it. Let's hope so. We did the best we could. It's a good thing I saw the bushes moving, Mary said, and shrugged her shoulders shakily. She imagined what would have happened to the old woman if the girl had not been on the road at the right time. A week passed. During this time, they found out the identity of the old woman. It turned out that this is a resident of the village, which is located at a distance of about 50 kilometers from the place where Mary found her grandmother. The locals unanimously assured that she lives alone, although she has an adult son. He seemed to live in the city and rarely appeared at his mother's house. The old woman had given up lately. She almost never got out of bed. She could hardly move around the house. And now suddenly she was in the woods and so far from her home. Mary watched with curiosity as Grandma Vera was going somewhere. Where are you going, Grandma? Asked the girl. The hospital called me. I gave my phone number to the Felger and asked him to let me know when it would be possible to visit the old woman. And what? She came to her senses. Mary exclaimed with joy. All this time she had been very worried about that grandmother. She felt sorry for her. She came to her senses a long time ago, but the visit was allowed only now, smiled Grandma Vera. I'll go and visit her. I baked her some pies. The neighbors say that she is a lonely grandmother. It will probably be pleasant to her such attention. I'm coming with you, Mary said with confidence. I want to talk to her too. Is that convenient? Grandma Vera was confused. I don't know if it's necessary. After all, I'm the one who found her. All right, what's the matter now? Get ready then. The bus will be here in 15 minutes. Mary thought it would be just like the movie she liked to watch. She and her grandmother would go up to the whitewashed room where the rescued old woman would be lying on a bed. All wrapped in wires. Me, but no. The strict receptionist from the waiting room told the visitors to wait for the patient downstairs on a leather couch. There were already a lot of people here, patients in gowns, pajamas and slippers, and their relatives and friends who came to check on their own. Soon the old woman appeared. Mary was the first to see her and recognized her immediately. Her grandmother looked much better now, still thin, but her face was no longer that frightening dead pallor, and her light green eyes looked quite conscious and very friendly. How do you do? said Baba Vera, waving her hand. Now she too noticed the old woman. The patient smiled and moved towards the visitors. It was only then that Mary realized that the grandmother didn't know who had come to see her. They had seen her that October day, but she hadn't. She wasn't in the right state to remember their faces. Hello, smiled the old woman, coming closer. A kind, warm smile, good, calm. So it was you who saved me then. My granddaughter, Mary, answered Grandma Vera. Thank you, girl. I don't know what would have happened to me if it hadn't been for your attentiveness. Of course I do. But I don't want to think about it, no matter what. Then they all got to know each other. 
turns out the old lady's name is Poppy Parson. She lives in the next village, quite a long way from where Mary found her. How on earth did you get here? wondered Grandma Vera. She looked very young compared to Poppy Parson. There must have been 10 or 12 years difference between them. It's a sad story, sighed Poppy Parson. I've been ill, I've been sick. I got weak. I thought it was the end of me. But I don't know. It was like my mind went blank. Something came over me. I gathered up my last strength and went wherever I was going, without any purpose. It was like someone was calling me from the woods. Temporary insanity. So I must have reached you somehow, and then I collapsed from exhaustion. And Mary found me. Baba Vera shook her head sadly. For some reason Mary did not believe this part of Poppy Parson's story. It seemed to her that the old woman was hiding something from them, otherwise the new acquaintance was quite sincere and pleasant to talk to. Mary could see that she and Vera had found a common language. A couple of minutes later the women were already discussing a variety of topics health, news, weather, and they couldn't get enough of talking, like old friends. They also had a common misfortune their wayward sons. Poppy Parson's son was outwardly a prosperous man he studied, married, settled in the city. But his mother's life hadn't interested him since. He became like a complete stranger to the one who had raised him and put him on his feet, 